What happens when you finally kick the bucket, so to speak? Despite our mostly science-grounded views on death these days, it seems many of us believe in life after it. In 2014, UK citizens were polled by The Telegraph, and just under 60% of respondents said they believe some part of us lives on. In the US, still a very Christian nation, Pew Research in 2015 asked people what happened after you die. The survey found that 72% of Americans believed you go to heaven, which was described as a place where people who have led good lives are eternally rewarded. 54% of US adults replied that they believed in hell, which was described as a place where people who have led bad lives and die without being sorry are eternally punished. With that in mind, welcome to this episode of the Infographic Show, What Happens When You Die. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell button so that you can be part of our notification squad. It seems a lot of people do believe that after death we might be ensconced in some cloud-strewn paradise, or conversely, if we haven't adhered to the ethics prescribed to us by our chosen religion or denomination of that religion, we might be faced with eternal hellfire and the prospect of groveling to a bearded red man who hardly ever puts down his pitchfork. But let's start with some empirical realism and what actually happens to the body when we die. Physicians know you're dead because the heart stops beating and there is no longer any electrical activity in your brain. Brain death equals dead, although machines can keep you going a little bit longer. You can also have what's called a cardiac death, which means the heart stops beating and blood no longer flows through your body. The strange, even wonderful thing is, people that have suffered cardiac death but have been brought back to life have said they were aware of what was going on around them. Others have talked about walking towards a light in such a near-death experience. You can be brought back from what we call clinical death, but you only have a grace period of about four to six minutes. But let's say you get to the light and pass through. This is what we call biological death. Game over, the final whistle, dead as a dodo. This is where it gets kind of undignified, but what do you care, you're dead. Once you're definitely no longer with us, your muscles relax, and this means your sphincter will too, meaning that triple whopper and large fries you had for lunch will spill out of you. The gas you have in you may also leak out and cause a stink. The same goes for the pee you've got in your bladder. So dying, not surprisingly, is a bit of a messy affair. And men, you might even ejaculate. As for women, you may give birth after you have died if you were pregnant, which is something called coffin birth. It doesn't happen often though. Instead of pushing, it's the gases in the abdomen that squeeze the newborn into the world. As the body gets rid of what is trapped inside, noises may be emitted from your mouth as air escapes. Nurses and people working close to dead bodies have regularly reported hearing very alive sounding moans and groans coming from dead bodies. You may twitch, but this doesn't mean there is life in you, these are just muscle contractions. You could also soon get an erection if you died lying on your stomach and the blood flowed down there. All your blood will pool to a certain area of your body. This is called liver mortis, and it's the reason parts of you will have that dark purple color you have seen on TV. These are the lovely things that can happen quite shortly after you go. With no blood flowing through your body, it will begin to cool down, known as alger mortis, or simply death chill. It will keep cooling until it is the same temperature as your surroundings, you will become stiff within about 2-6 to six hours, and this we call rigor mortis. This is because calcium is getting into your muscle cells, cells break down without blood flow, and this leads to bacteria growth, and that's why you start to decompose. You may look like your hair or your nails have grown, but that isn't the case. What is happening is that your skin is receding, giving the impression of growth. The skin will loosen too, and blisters will appear on the body. The next stage is putrefaction, when bacteria and microorganisms start feasting on you. You'll soon start to stink as bad as anything you could have imagined while you were alive. One person described the smell as rotten eggs, feces, and a used toilet left out for a month times 1000. It is unholy. Soon everything that is soft becomes liquefied, with things like bones, cartilage, and hair remaining strong. You're already well on your way to decomposing by the time you are being put in the ground, but if embalmed and buried, decomposition could be a slow process. Left above ground, you'll be a liquefied mess within about a month, feasted on by insects, maggots, plants, and animals. Underground, some experts say it might take 8 to 12 years before you are reduced to nothing but a skeleton. After around 50 years, even your bones will become part of the earth. We should add the rate of decomposition depends on all manner of factors, too many to list here, but we think you get the picture. While some people report that their near-death experience was a scene to behold, that's not always the case. One person writing on Reddit said his experience was as follows, it was just black emptiness, no thoughts, no consciousness, nothing. Is there really something else? Irish empiricist philosopher George Berkeley was so hell-bent on knowing what happens after death, or those moments during clinical death, that he actually hanged himself to the point of death with a friend nearby ready to cut him down before he died. 
He believed there was something between heaven and earth, perhaps what philosophers have called the ether. The story has become lore in philosophical circles, but it's thought all Berkeley really discovered was that hanging hurts your neck. French philosopher René Descartes believed the soul was separate from the body, as many religions will tell you, and perhaps when we die, something lingers on. Friedrich Nietzsche talked about the concept of eternal recurrence, or eternal return, meaning all existence or energy in the universe has forever and will forever keep repeating itself ad infinitum. You live the same life again and again forever. Now doesn't that make you want to live well? Here we can make similarities to the Buddhist belief of the wheel of samsara, wherein all souls or lives will begin a cycle again after death, except not the same exact life. Something we call reincarnation, which some people say is connected to what we sometimes call deja vu. Buddhists believe we can end this vicious cycle if we can become truly enlightened, therefore achieving nirvana. Or do we make our way to heaven after our bodies stop working, tipping our cap to St. Peter at the pearly gates, hoping he won't deny us entrance for stealing that candy bar when we went on a school trip to Niagara Falls? Will we be taken into paradise, a place replete with excellent foods and gorgeous maidens that make your dead knees go weak? Or will we simply seed the earth, our souls nothing more than a worldly fancy that took our minds off our cosmic insignificance and the feeling of futility that we sometimes experience here on terra firma? A Russian researcher enters a room where he expects to see his human test subjects alive and well. Instead, he witnesses absolute pandemonium. He hears screams of the damned and in front of him is a body that's been torn apart and eviscerated. It looks as though the Antichrist himself has been in the room. Even the survivors have had chunks of flesh ripped from their arms and legs, their ends of their fingers shown exposed bone, their faces are sheared of skin. What is this inferno of madness, thinks the researcher. Uh, this wasn't exactly how the experiment was supposed to turn out, he thinks. Okay, the food wasn't great, we might have made those beds a bit more comfortable, but tearing each other to shreds over a bit of lost sleep? Come on guys, that's not very comrade of you. That nightmare scenario is straight out of the famous Russian sleep experiment, if you believe it really happened. Let's start from the beginning of the story and then we'll tell you what our team of world-class sleuths dug up on the truth behind this horrific experiment. So, it's the late 1940s and Soviet-era researchers have created a stimulant that they believe can keep a person awake for a long time, which is handy when you're fighting a war. In the Second World War, the Germans had their version of such a stimulant, which was a formidable methamphetamine called pervitin. The Americans and the British would dose their troops with the amphetamine benzedrine, which was similar to your garden variety speed. The Soviets are looking to up the ante and use their own version of a drug, which won't lead to a total wipeout after a three-day long binge. They've made something special, but they need to test it on humans first. It's not hard to find test subjects since prisoners of war were aplenty in the 1940s. And where prisoners were concerned, bypassing ethical considerations wasn't such a big deal. They set up a test area where five subjects will stay. It's a sealed environment into which the researchers can release the stimulant in gas form and check if the levels of oxygen are okay. The subjects have been given dried food, each a bed with no bedding, running water, and a toilet. The researchers listen to the subjects through a microphone, and there are cameras through which they can monitor the subjects. The only portholes to the outside are five-inch thick glass windows, which are barely good enough to see a shadow from. The scene is set and the five men seem in good spirits for the first three days. The gas is doing its job and the researchers are pleased about that. One researcher tells another, Nazi meth, what a joke, just wait until the world sees what we've cooked up, Comrade Stalin will be most pleased. The subjects have agreed to try and stay awake for 30 days and have been falsely informed that if they can make the 30 days, they'll get their freedom. Such a deal seems fair to them. Things turn slightly dark around the four day mark when the subjects start discussing war and the horrors they've seen. They speak of traumas, continual nightmares, other ghastly things they witnessed. Day 5, and things get worse, the men start showing signs of psychosis, talking to themselves and things that are not there. They grow paranoid of each other and start whispering into those microphones, telling stories about the other subjects. The researchers of course know all about sleep deprivation. After 5 days, the mind can turn on a person. Hallucinations can seem real and horrifying. But, they wondered, was it the loss of sleep or the gas itself? Suspicions about the gas effects were more solid at day 9, when one guy just started screaming, howling like a banshee and running up and down the room. He screamed so much he seemed to tear his vocal cords, because after a few hours he squeaked like a children's toy. A few more days passed and there was an eerie silence. The men could not be seen from the cameras. They were alive for sure since the oxygen levels indicated five breathing men, but where were they? 
The researchers hadn't wanted to interrupt the study, but they felt that they had no choice, and so said into an intercom, We're opening the chamber to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one of you immediate freedom. They heard one voice respond. It said, We no longer want to be freed. What was this? Had they been getting ripped on that gas and were now addicted? The researchers said there's nothing we can do but open the door. They opened the vents and let fresh air displace the residual stimulant. What the researchers heard next was the men screaming again, pleading for more of that damn fine gas. WTF, thought one of the Russians. Those guys are seriously hooked. They opened the doors on day 15, and to their surprise saw one man was dead. You know what the scene looked like because we laid that out for you in the intro, but we didn't tell you what happened shortly after the gruesome discovery of the half-eaten man and the wounded survivors. On closer inspection, the researchers saw that the wounds on the men were very bad. They looked as if they might have been self-inflicted too. They had torn the skin and muscles from their own chests, which revealed the horrific sight of the men's lungs. Each man, it had seemed, had performed this macabre surgery on himself. Blood vessels that were still working had been removed. Other internal organs were seen laid out on the floor like a piece of art, and the men were going to eat those morsels. They were dining on their own bodies and doing it with enthusiasm. The researchers called for backup, not daring to go near those poor wretches. They closed the door to howls of the men pleading for the gas to come back. When soldiers arrived to help remove the subjects, the extrication process wasn't exactly fun. One of the subjects ripped a man's throat right out, while another soldier had his balls removed. Five soldiers lost their lives in total, but some of the victims took their own lives after the event. Once the subjects were out, the doctors injected enough morphine into them to sedate a Canadian moose, but the men still fought like wild beasts. One subject bled out and his heart stopped beating, but he still carried on screaming, Give me gas! I need gas! A doctor had some bones broken during that grim spectacle. The three others were eventually sedated and strapped and moved to a secure facility. The researchers talked to each other saying things like, that wasn't meant to happen, was it? They hated to admit it, but maybe the Nazis, the Brits, and the Americans had done the right thing and just plying their troops with top-notch crank. The surgeons got to work on putting the missing organs and bits of viscera back into one man, but this guy almost broke through his restraints. When the docs finally got the anesthetic into him, the man's heart stopped and he died right on the spot. The autopsy showed he had broken nine bones and his muscles were torn all over his body. When they tried to fix up the next man, they decided two deaths were enough and didn't use an anesthetic. They patched him up nice, sewing his ruptured organs and laying skin grafts on him. The head surgeon said this man should not be alive after what he's gone through, but he admired his own work. A nurse commented that during the surgery the beast had been smiling at her. She did wonder how male carnal instincts can remain functioning during the worst times. Maybe with death comes the need to create something new, she philosophized, but quickly shook herself out of her reverie. The man suddenly started making a wheezing sound as if he wanted to say something. The nurse, quick to catch on, handed him a pen and a pad below it. The man wrote, keep cutting. Wow, she thought, what a maniac. She was glad she would not reciprocated his flirty smile. As for the other maniac, he laughed like a hyena during his bodily reconstruction. He said he wanted that gas, the good stuff, and when asked why, he said he just needed it to stay awake. The surgeon mused, if these guys weren't so hell-bent on eating themselves, they'd make excellent night shift custodians, cleaners perhaps, or maybe security, but he knew all too well that they couldn't be trusted to wash their hands. Then, a former KGB agent had an excellent idea, something that had amazingly escaped everyone else's thoughts. Why not put these poor suckers back on that gas? He said it seems the problems all start when they all go into withdrawal. Hi, they're okay, if not a bit hyper and paranoid. We can work with that. Once back on the gas, they were fine and dandy, but then something strange happened. The EEG monitor showed crazy brain activity, but then it just died down. One man flatlined. Finally, he just died. His last boost of that junk had done him in, or at least it seemed so. The last guy ended up back in the study room with the other guy seemingly dead on the bed, but three researchers were in there too. Suddenly, one of the researchers shot the commander and then shot the subject. He then shouted out loud, I won't be locked in here with these things, not with you. What are you? I must know. The subject that was shot but evidently was not dead replied, Have you forgotten so easily? We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. That was almost the end, but for good measure, the researcher put a bullet into the man's chest, which might have breached the Hippocratic Oath somewhat, but hey, harsh times call for harsh measures. The End
So, a lot of people seem to think this all actually happened. Now, without much investigation, one can easily tell by reading this catastrophic flash fiction that it's written by someone whose grammatical skills need improving. Not only that though, the story simply doesn't make sense at times. Quite a few times someone dies and then just comes back to life, and we don't think it's on purpose by the storyteller. He just forgets what he said or her. On another part, the writer says that the oxygen levels indicated the men were alive, and the researchers knew that, and then in the next part he said the researchers were not sure if they'd all died. But there's more than bad writing that gives this away. Hmm, where do we start? Well, we might not need to tell you that you cannot rip out vital organs and lay them on the floor like a bunch of textbooks. That's pure fiction. Those men would have died from blood loss or shock. Remember that they were discovered like this and left for some time before the soldiers came. Ok, you say, but that was the gas working. This was a secret experiment that went wrong. High on that wicked drug, maybe men could routinely come back from the dead and rip out their own organs and even do a bit of flirting when the mood took them. How do we know that it isn't true? Well, there is the matter of recorded history and plausible science. No gas has ever been discovered that can keep a person awake for 15 days. Never mind turn that person into a self-loathing zombie. There is no history of the experiment anywhere but on a website that's known for its scary, fictional, I'll say it again, fictional tales. It would be astounding if one author alone, writing badly from his or her bedroom, had access to more secret information than the CIA and the British Secret Services. As we said in the story, and we embellish this part ourselves, many soldiers on all sides of the war broke so bad that they could stay awake longer. The officers were handing out that stuff like candy, but not even the most dedicated ice fiend could stay awake for 15 days, and those badly buzzed soldiers would have likely only done 24 to possibly 36 hours awake. The Pentagon has even done studies on this, and even if men are forced to stay awake for more than 48 hours, they will become pretty slow and pretty much useless as soldiers. They'll make tons of mistakes, which is not ideal in war when you have to be constantly alert. Sure, the speed helped the Germans with their blitzkrieg attacks, but the drugs had to be taken with some precautions. With this in mind, the Russians would not have even tried this experiment. There is something called morphine syndrome that can cause severe delirium and very bad insomnia, and sufferers can go into a dreamlike state. We say dreamlike because even if they don't sleep, they will have microsleeps. Plus, no one with this disease has ever started eating themselves. Sure, perhaps a noxious agent sprayed into a room full of guys can kill someone, but it's very unlikely it could turn them into gas-addicted zombies. There's nothing in scientific literature that supports anything in this experiment. There's another thing that can cause massive sleep loss, and that's called fatal familial insomnia. But that's passed down through genes and isn't caused by environmental agents. And again, it doesn't and it will never make someone just want to rip out their own organs and eat them. There's just nothing that exists in this world that aligns with the story, and if it did, we would expect it to have appeared in medical journals before it became an internet meme. Then again, many of you have been asking in the comments how we managed to put out so many episodes per day. Maybe the entire staff of the infographic show are crank addicted zombies with an undying lust for human flesh after all. Of course, that's preposterous. But isn't that exactly what a team of crank addicted zombies with an undying lust for human flesh would want you to think? The Russian sleep experiment isn't a bad story, but it could have been better. Sleep deprivation is actually a torture that has been used by militaries, and that itself can drive a person half crazy. Still, in this story when you add the addictive gas and the organ rug and the reanimation, it just isn't believable. As the Hollywood cliché goes, poised coital, some of us sit back against the headboard, proud of our accomplishment at gratifying our lover, spouse, or one night stand, and then light up a cigarette. How was it for you? Good enough, you surmise, as you take a well-earned drag? Or are you the kind of person to roll over in an instant, perhaps leaving your bedfellow exasperated and hardly ready to catch some Z's? Or perhaps you spare just a moment reposing, and then compose yourself and start again? Do you cuddle up? Have a chat? Talk about deep things? Or even request a favor of your lover? According to research, these are all common. But what happens to our bodies during and after sex? That's what we'll find out today. In this episode of The Infographic Show, what happens to your body while you are having sex? Today we'll talk about what happens to both men and women having heterosexual sex, and when we say sex, we mean intercourse, lovemaking, copulation, fornication, or as the Brits say, having it off. So, let's start with the man. What happens to him? At some point during sex, men reach a point of no return. This is sometimes called ejaculatory inevitability. Pulse rate and blood pressure rise, the sperm leaves him, and his penis has contractions. Now he can return to resting and let his body calm down, which apparently happens faster for men than women. 
The penis becomes flaccid, and most men will have to wait some time before they can go at it again, but it all depends on age, fitness, and of course the urge to return to the hearth of passion. Some guys at this point will just want to go to sleep. Is this plain rude, or is it a biological necessity? Well, listen up disgruntled women, science says it's natural for men to want to sleep, and for various reasons, notwithstanding the obvious, in that it's often nighttime and tiredness might be normal, Another reason is because upon reaching orgasm, men release lots of pent-up anxiety. So do women, and they might feel tired too, but it seems men sleep more after sex, according to research. Another thing is brain chemistry. All these chemicals spill out in the brain when men ejaculate, including serotonin, oxytocin, norepinephrine, vasopressin, and nitric oxide. Some of these chemicals are related to de-stressing and the readiness to sleep. This can lead to that feeling of, phew! and then men want to relax just as they would after any strenuous exercise. It's kind of like getting a hit of morphine, and apparently that hit is much stronger when having sex than when masturbating. One doctor puts it like this when talking about the release of chemicals. They give you a very relaxed feeling, slow down your brainwaves and cerebral functioning, and make you feel pleasantly tired. But it's thought the hormone that is released called prolactin is the main reason men want to sleep. It gives you satisfaction, and the less of it you have, the more likely you will go for round two quicker. Really satisfied men may just turn over and start to snore. Another thing is, is that he might want to go for a pee. The reason? It's chemicals again. Oxytocin and prolactin affect the kidneys, and this makes him run off to the bathroom. Some experts also think it's to clean the urethra from bacteria, a kind of natural need. It might also just be because he's been holding it in during all that messing around. He then finds the pee won't come out. That is normal, because for the sperm to come out, your internal sphincter muscle clamps and this is to close the bladder. This is to stop the semen from entering the bladder. In a recent article in Cosmopolitan magazine, it was suggested that men who want to cuddle are keepers, but it also says that men who don't might just be succumbing to their own body's demands. You might find that your penis feels a bit sore, but this is just normal after all that contracting. Don't worry, it shouldn't last long. And don't be shocked if your testicles have shrunk, because this is normal too. A doctor talking to Men's Health magazine explained it like this. When you ejaculate, the cremister muscle contracts and brings your testicles up closer to your body, giving you the perception that they're smaller. Lastly, you may get a cramp in the toe. Apparently this happens a lot, but it's just because orgasm causes stimulation in the nerves, especially S1 in the spinal column, and that nerve affects the toes. If you look at some research, it also says some men's moods change dramatically after sex, but given the release of all that tension, and all those chemicals flooding out, that's not so surprising. Some men have reported feeling emotionally handicapped after a great orgasm, and that's thought to be because huge amounts of dopamine were released. It's like coming down from a drug that makes you feel happy or ecstatic. In women, the feelings can be similar, as we shall see. So, what about postcoital women? Well, women may not always orgasm. According to an article in Psychology Today, which cited a number of studies, around half of women will regularly orgasm during intercourse, about 20% of women rarely orgasm, 20% consistently orgasm, and 5% never orgasm. When they do, it's different from a man's one great push to the sun, as women have what has been called rapid rhythmic contractions. This can be quite the event, and some women certainly show this in their face, sometimes looking like they've had an ecstatic experience. These shockwaves go through her genitals, her anus, her uterus, and her pelvis, and she too will have a magnificent rush of chemicals flooding through her brain. She may experience female ejaculation, which is when a milky liquid will come out of her urethra. Don't worry women, there's nothing wrong with this. But what about when a lot of liquid comes out? A neurophysiologist from Rutgers University in Newark says it's not the same milky stuff if it comes out in large amounts. In that case, she says, it is urine diluted with substances from the female prostate. Scientists are still not clear as to why some women do this and others don't, but it's certainly not harmful. So. Why are women often up for a chat about tomorrow's activities or the meaning of life while some men are already halfway to La La Land? According to a study in the Netherlands undertaken in 2005, women are more focused than men during sex, their minds completely set to the task of reaching orgasm. This is because their amygdala and hippocampus, which regulate feelings, kind of turns off. They are at one with sex, well, at least if they are fully immersed in it. Once we've come, we return to our bodies, our consciousness recalibrates, and our emotional intelligence returns, said an article in Bustle about this phenomenon. But after sex, they switch back. And it's then they get that lovely hit of oxytocin, sometimes called the cuddle chemical. One study found that people with high levels of testosterone release less of this after sex, and men generally have high levels, 
Some women do too, of course, just not as much. So men, next time you turn over, blame your lack of oxytocin. And women may not experience a refractory period at all. This is the downtime men need to get ready to do it again. Note, teenagers may not need much downtime, but then again, sex doesn't always last that long for these hyper-carnal kids. Women are multi-orgasmic, and they usually could just start again. But be careful there, women, because sex can be more painful for you than it can be for men. Women might cramp up in the uterus, and this is due to the cuddle drug, oxytocin. Let's now call that the double-edged sword chemical. There might also be some burning because of the vaginal tissues getting dry, but lubrication can help. The stinging doesn't mean there is a problem, but obviously if it persists longer than a day or two, it might be something else. And if men see shrinkage, then women see the opposite. In their breasts, at least. Many women's breasts get bigger after sex, and in some women, by as much as 25%. According to Women's Health magazine, just how swollen the breasts become differs from woman to woman. The same article also said a woman's clitoris will become very small at point of orgasm, almost disappearing. At the same time, women's nipples may become more sensitive, but this is very natural. Other reports say some women become giddy after sex, and others feel great confidence, seeing their bodies as much more attractive than before. Most reports we can find state that while some women may experience a slump after the sex, it's the men that really suffer from depression, sometimes a week long. But as the saying goes, what goes up must come down, and most of the time, it's worth the ride. A young woman walks down an alleyway on her way home from college, illuminated only in small puddles of light by the lamps above her. Little does she know that a man will be waiting for her as she emerges into the car park. Poor soul, she thinks, after seeing that well-dressed man is struggling to carry books to his Volkswagen Beetle, especially as one of his arms is in a sling. She walks over to him and offers assistance, to which the polite and softly spoken man gives her his utmost thanks. As she takes some of the books and leans down to place them in the passenger seat, he hits her over the head with a tire iron. He gets into the driver's seat and leaves the scene. He'll strangle her like he did many others. He'll do unspeakable things to her. He is the quintessential maniac. His name is Ted Bundy. The scene we've just described to you was the modus operandi of this particular serial killer. Well, when he had planned his murders. Bundy's thing was to use his good looks, his speaking skills, and his educated demeanor to lure people into his trap. At times, he'd put his arm in a sling or even walk on crutches to give his victims a false sense of security. How harmful could a man be on crutches, one dressed in a suit, driving a cute car? This is why he was so hard to catch. He just didn't fit the profile of a serial killer, one who did absolutely disgusting things to people at the moment they died and after they died. He probably should have been caught much earlier than he was. After all, when young women went out and never came back, on a few occasions witnesses came forward and said they had seen a man lurking around, a man with one arm in a sling, a man that drove a VW Buck. 22-year-old Brenda Carol Ball was last seen talking to a guy in a car park who had brown hair and an arm in a sling. Soon after, Susan Elaine Rancourt went missing, never to return. Two people came forward after that and said they'd been approached by a man who wore a sling. He'd asked them for help putting some books into his car, a VW Beetle. Then, on June 11, 1974, University of Washington student Georgianne Hawkins went missing. Her body would never be found. We know that she'd been with her boyfriend and she left him after midnight. On her walk home to her sorority house, she was spotted by a male friend who was driving a car. He shouted out of the window, Hey George, what's happening? She chatted with him for a minute or two and expressed that she was a bit nervous about her upcoming Spanish exam. Later, witnesses told the cops that they'd seen some guy skulking around in an alleyway close to Hawkins's, a guy whose arm was in a sling. One woman said he'd asked her to help him load a briefcase into a light brown Volkswagen Beetle. Little did she know at the time how close she was to being murdered. Hawkins wasn't so lucky. She fell for the trick, as any helpful person might. We know what happened to her because Bundy later talked about it. When she was close enough to his car, he hit her over the head with a crowbar, which knocked her clean out. When she came around, she was obviously confused, although to Bundy's surprise, she seemed to think that he'd turned up to help her with Spanish. She was evidently in shock. This is what Bundy said about that. It's odd the kinds of things people will say under those circumstances. He strangled her and dumped her body, a body he would return to on at least three occasions. You can only imagine how demented he was returning to a body that was decomposing. He had his reasons, but we'll get to that. Bundy was brazen, there's no doubt about it. He didn't ever think he'd be caught. He thought he was too intelligent for the police. After all, he'd worked in politics. He worked as an assistant director of the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Committee, where he wrote a paper on rape prevention. He did a stint at the Department of Emergency Services, where he talked about missing women and how to find them. 
and that's likely why Bundy didn't have any qualms about returning to the alleyway from where he'd picked up Hawkins. The day after the abduction, he was there at the same time as the police, hiding in plain sight as he picked up one of the girl's shoes and her necklace. If he wasn't picking up girls in a car park or close by one, he was sneaking into basements while they slept and then bludgeoning the victim with some kind of iron bar. Bundy was like the boogeyman, a serial killer that crawled through windows and viciously attacked people while they were at their most vulnerable. But he was also a con artist. He played confidence tricks and he was very good at it. Investigators knew that when girls went missing, at times a man was seen with an arm in a sling, a man that owned a VW Beetle. Surely Bundy was easy prey after that. How many VW Beetles were there in those areas when the abduction happened? Areas dotted around the Pacific Northwest. The reality was Bundy's reign of terror was only in the early stages. The public and police were worried, that's for sure. Young folks stopped hitching rides and many became fearful of talking to strangers or leaving their windows open at night. Those with most to fear were young white women. Bundy's victims were almost always in their late teens or early 20s. They were Caucasian and most of them were attractive. They studied at university and were said to be intelligent and gifted students. Another thing was the fact that each girl disappeared at a college where construction work was going on. Could the disappearances be linked, wondered investigators? They just didn't know. They had very little forensic evidence to work with, and there were no bodies. That didn't mean the cops thought the girls had just taken off someplace. Nothing about their personalities and state of mind suggested that. Only weeks after Hawkins went missing, two women were abducted in broad daylight at Lake Sammamish State Park, not far from the city of Seattle. Bundy had first approached five women in the park, and in what they later described as a Canadian or British accent, the man introduced himself as Ted. Ted, dressed in a pressed white tennis outfit with one arm in a sling, politely asked them if they could help him unload a sailboat from his bronze-colored Volkswagen Beetle. Four of them said no, but one followed him to his car. Thankfully, she ran away when she became aware that there was no sailboat. That day, Bundy managed to enlist one woman for help, and he later abducted another close to a restroom. Both would die. Did he kill one in front of the other? He once said that that was true, but close to his execution date, he recanted that terribly bleak detail. This is not a story about his crimes, though. What we want to know is how the hell did the police not get closer to Bundy, seeing as he was using the same car and the same sling trick and so the same modus operandi? He even told the girls that escaped that he was named Ted. What more did the cops need? A written confession? They were closer but still a long way from getting him. They at least now had good description of this Ted guy, and it did quite look like him. In no time at all, this sketch appeared in many newspapers and was shown on TV. Remember that we said Bundy worked at the Department of Emergency Services? Well, one of his co-workers there saw the sketch and heard about the Volkswagen Beetle, and she knew she was looking at her colleague, Mr. Bundy. She made a call to the cops, as did another person that knew Ted Bundy. The cops at the time were receiving something like 200 of these calls in one day, and they quickly assumed that a clean-cut law student with no criminal record couldn't be behind the abductions. Serial killers didn't look like that, or so they thought. The heat was on though, and Bundy knew it. A couple of months after his last murder, bones were being found. Those bones were the remains of his victims, scattered in various places where the cops hadn't thought to look. It was fortunate for Bundy then that he was accepted to study at the University of Utah Law School. He packed his bags and headed south in August of 74. He was only in Utah a month when he started killing again. September 2nd, a hitchhiker. October 2nd, a 16-year-old girl. October 18th, a 17-year-old girl from a pizza parlor. It turned out that she was the daughter of a police chief. After her decomposing body was found on a hiking trail, the post-mortem exam revealed that Bundy had kept her alive for perhaps seven days. Each had been subjected to the most brutal depravity, although Bundy admitted years later that after he killed them, he shampooed their hair and applied makeup to their faces, keeping them in a state that he liked. He wanted the physical possession of the remains and he wanted to do what he wanted to them. He sometimes chopped them, sometimes kept heads in his apartment, and he dressed them in the way he wanted them to look. And then he took a photograph. When you work hard to do something right, he once said, you don't want to forget it. More abductions happened, more murders, as well as attempted abductions. The disappearances were reported in the media, and after reading about them, a woman named Elizabeth Klepfer who dated Bundy back when he was in Washington put two and two together. She not only called the King County cops and told them that she thought she had been dating the killer, but she also told the Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office and said the same. She was still talking to Bundy at this point on the telephone, but she didn't say anything about her calls. For her, the sketch looked like Ted Bundy. The car was Bundy's, and so the murders following him around were just too much of a coincidence. Bundy started then killing in Colorado. Things didn't change much. 
death by blunt force trauma, sometimes strangulation, bodies dumped, mutilated, sometimes wearing clothes that weren't theirs. 1975 drew to an end and there were more victims, some whose bodies have never been found. 76 turned out to be another bloody year, so how come Washington cops weren't at the very least looking at Bundy? They only did that after they discovered a new toy, a computer, and a database. They found that they could input data about the murders and the computer would compare that data to data already in the system. Thousands of names were in that database, but only 26 names matched the crimes. Bundy's was one of them. The problem was connecting the Utah and Colorado murders to the Pacific Northwest murders. At the time, there were no large databases containing all the state's police departments. The fact of the matter was, while the cops should have known better after the tip-offs, because Bundy moved around, he managed to evade capture. But then, he was pulled over by a cop in a Salt Lake City suburb after he'd been driving around looking suspicious. On searching Bundy's car, the cop found quite the collection of suspicious items. A ski mask, trash bags, handcuffs, a crowbar lengths of rope, and an ice pick. All that was pretty much the consummate serial killer stash. It didn't take long for the cops to understand that they might have a maniac on their hands, and they had the phone call from Bundy's lover in their records, and they had his car description from one of the abductions. Still, after searching his house, the police didn't have enough to keep him. One thing they didn't find that day was a bunch of photographs of his dead victims. Things would have been very different had they discovered those awful snaps. Bundy was on the loose again, but he was being monitored all day long. Some of the cops flew to Seattle to speak to Bundy's lover. She told them that some things just didn't add up, such as why did he keep crutches in his house? And what about that plaster of Paris? Not to mention the surgical gloves, big knives, meat cleaver, and a bag full of women's clothes. Bundy was certainly in a fix now, but he was by no means done. He sold his beloved beetle, but that was soon sequestered by investigators who gave the interior a good going over. What they found were strands of hair from females, and those females were very likely victims of murder. Police brought Bundy in and put him in a lineup, but they only had enough evidence to possibly put him on trial for aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault. His parents paid his $15,000 bail and off he went, once again, a free man, but under heavy round-the-clock surveillance. He actually lived with his lover again while he was on bail, which should have been a very strange time for her. At this point, the lead investigators from Utah, Washington, and Colorado all finally got together and shared their stories and what evidence they had. They were pretty darn sure that they had a serial killer on their hands, and an utterly depraved one at that. Before they could get him for murder, though, he faced trial for kidnapping and assault. He was found guilty and sentenced to 1 to 15 years in the Utah State Prison. While in there, he was charged with just one of the murders. Bundy was a desperate man around this time, likely knowing that his crimes or most of them would catch up with him and he'd be looking at the death penalty. He chose to defend himself, and because of that he didn't have to wear handcuffs or leg shackles in court. On one of those court appearances, he managed to convince the court he needed the library and he leapt from a window. He actually survived for six days around the wilderness of the Aspen Mountains, but was eventually picked up by the cops. The case against him for that one murder was actually quite weak, but it seemed that Bundy believed they would get him. If he was done for that case, more cases might follow. Over a period of six months, he got his hands on a floor plan of the jail. He saved money after getting it smuggled in by visitors, and he also got himself a hacksaw. On December 30, 1977, Bundy filled his bed with books, so it might look like he was sleeping. He then got through the ceiling and into an apartment. There, he changed into civilian clothes and then he walked out of the jail. He went from Chicago to Atlanta to Florida in stolen cars, only stopping to steal certain items or wallets from people. On January 15, 1978, he walked around at night in Florida State University. In the early hours of the morning, he assaulted, bludgeoned, strangled, and bit three sleeping women in three different rooms, all within about 15 minutes. Two of them survived but were very badly injured. He left the sorority house and went to an apartment building where he viciously attacked another girl, fracturing her skull and jaw. There he left behind one of his favorite things, his pantyhose mask. Police also found sperm and hair samples. Bundy later drove to Jacksonville where he abducted and killed a 12-year-old girl. A few days later, he was stopped by a police officer. During questioning, he kicked the man's legs and ran for it. The cop fired warning shots, but Bundy kept running. He was too slow, he was tackled, and in spite of his best efforts, he couldn't get the gun from the cop. Bundy was done for, sat in a car, handcuffed, on his way to certain death. Still, this Florida policeman didn't know who he had in the car. He was not aware that he was carrying one of the USA's most wanted fugitives. He certainly had no idea that the occupant of his vehicle would become known as one of the worst, most vile serial killers of all time, a demon whose warped brutality knew no bounds. 
And do you know what Bundy said to the cop while he was in the car? He said, I wish you had killed me. Eventually, he confessed to 30 murders, but there could have been many more. On January 24, 1989, age 42, Bundy took his final breaths in the electric chair. His last words were, I'd like you to give my love to my family and friends. Men freeze in place, holding pickaxes and shovels at the ready inside a well-lit tunnel under the Mexican countryside. They can hear the vibrations of a vehicle above them and wary of making any noise that might give them away hold their work as the prison patrol passes overhead. 30 feet below the prison's main yard, there's little chance of being discovered, but after several months of secret tunneling, they can't take any chances, especially when they are so close to their goal. The prison cell of Mexico's most famous drug kingpin, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. For months, they've tunneled through solid rock with nothing more than pickaxes and shovels, moving as fast as they can with their limited equipment but with great caution. The work would go much faster if they could use modern tunnel digging equipment like jackhammers and boring machines, but not only would that create noise that might give them away, it would draw a great deal of attention to their staging area just a mile from the prison perimeter. Prior to tunnel digging, El Chapo's powerful drug cartel purchased a small plot of land as close to the prison as they could get and began constructing two small homes as a cover for their real intentions. The homes never made it past a rough brick outer shell though, because of course they would not be inhabited. Instead, they provided the cover needed to start construction on the tunnel that would set El Chapo free. But the tunnel crew was facing incredible pressure to finish as quickly as possible. Due to his history of escaping from prison and evading police raids, Mexican authorities could at any time transfer El Chapo to another prison in order to foil any possible escape attempts. Every day the tunnelers took to get their boss was another day the entire thing could be for nothing, and a new escape attempt in a completely different location would have to be devised. But that's not all. The unfinished buildings were beginning to draw attention from local officials and curious villagers alike. Why would someone start construction on an empty piece of land and then suddenly stop with only a shell of a home built? Time was running out and pressure was mounting. Inside his cell, El Chapo was the model prisoner. Despite his long history of ordering some of the most horrific violence Mexico has ever seen, El Chapo maintained a cordial and even pleasant attitude with his prison guards and fellow inmates. His conversations over the phone were carefully monitored, his mail checked by prison officials, but not a single hint of the ongoing plot was ever revealed. El Chapo was a true professional by now and patient, but his patience was running out. The tunnel diggers faced a daunting task from the start, and they knew they had to move fast. Despite the incredible pressure on them, however, they managed to not only reach El Chapo before any potential prison transfer, but they wound up breaking through to El Chapo's cell just 16 months into his prison stay. The tunnel they constructed was sophisticated, impressing officials who would later remark that a tunnel of that magnitude should have taken 18 months to two years to construct. Its walls were reinforced when needed, with wooden paneling, and a generator pumped fresh air through a mile-long ventilation system to keep the tunnel oxygenated. On the ground, the tunnelers had laid down rails and used a motorcycle to shuttle two carts, which were filled with dirt back and forth along the shaft. Once El Chapo was reached, he would ride on that same motorcycle and quickly shuttle the mile distance to freedom. All that dirt, though, had to go somewhere. And so the tunnelers cleverly transferred it to the tunnel opening, where others would spread the dirt around on the field outside, rather than dump it in giant piles, which would no doubt draw attention. Still, the presence of fresh dirt littering acres of empty fields was sure to eventually draw attention and questions that would not be easy to answer for the fake construction crew above ground. Suddenly, though, in the middle of the night on July 12, 2015, the sound of metal scraping came from El Chapo's shower inside his cell. Moments later, the ceramic bottom of the shower popped free, and a friendly face greeted the imprisoned drug lord, beckoning him into the darkness below. Wasting no time, El Chapo ducked into the secret tunnel, climbing down 30 feet into a tunnel only as wide across as a man but just tall enough for El Chapo to stand upright. Often derided for his short stature by his enemies, the tunnel diggers had made sure that the tunnel was just tall enough so the boss wouldn't have to hunch as he walked along it. A classy prison escape if we ever heard of one. 
A few feet into the mouth of the tunnel, El Chapo boarded a small motorcycle which had been affixed to metal tracks. The carts full of dirt that had pushed along for months now were gone, and just moments after leaving his cell, El Chapo was cruising along the well-lit tunnel like a kid on an amusement park ride. Two minutes later, El Chapo ended his joyride by climbing up wooden steps and popping up into the empty shell of a home his crew had been secretly working from for a year and a half. Changing into clean clothes, El Chapo then climbed onto a truck and whisked away into the dark of the night, leaving behind an incredible mile-long secret tunnel and completely frustrated prison system and Mexican government both. El Chapo would be caught again just months after his escape, after his newest safe house was given away weeks before his arrival by careless gunmen who were spotted by locals. Responding to reports of heavily armed men, Mexican officials put the house under surveillance and intercepted communications saying that grandma or aunt was coming to visit. Realizing this had to be a high-value target, officials waited for their chance to strike. One month later, Mexican Special Forces soldiers raided the home and killed several bodyguards, but El Chapo and one of his most senior lieutenants escaped via, you guessed it, a secret tunnel. Popping up a mile from the home, the two stole a vehicle at gunpoint, though the driver immediately reported it to the police. After issuing an alert for the stolen vehicle, the federal police officers discovered the stolen car and placed the two fugitives under arrest. El Chapo, however, wouldn't go without at least trying to buy his freedom. Knowing how easily corruptible public officials had been in the past, El Chapo bribed the police officers, offering them money, homes, and even lucrative jobs if they let him go. Little did the desperate kingpin know, however, that he was dealing with a brand new brand of Mexican police officer one not as easily corrupted as his predecessors. All four officers refused El Chapo, after which his offers of honey turned into vinegar, telling the police officers that they were all going to die. The four officers sent pictures to El Chapo to their superiors, only to be warned that the police had received a tip-off that 40 heavily armed assassins were en route to free El Chapo. With friendly forces still tied up at the compound, the officers were ordered to a nearby motel on the outskirts of town where they hold themselves up in an empty room and prepared for a possible shootout for their lives. All the while, El Chapo laughed, echoing his previous threats. Suddenly, a convoy of vehicles lit up the roadside, clearly headed for the lonely motel. The officers, armed with M16 assault rifles and pistols, prepared for what was surely their last stand. El Chapo taunted them, telling them they were about to face death, and after them, their families. Yet the officers held their ground, ready to die for duty's sake if need be. As the vehicles began to turn into the parking lot, however, El Chapo's taunts died in his throat. Once the glare of the headlights faded, the barricaded officers could see military trucks full of Mexican Marines rushing to take up defensive positions around the motel. Minutes later, a thoroughly defeated and dejected-looking El Chapo was dragged into an SUV and rushed off to an airfield. El Chapo would not escape from Mexican prison again, and two years later any hope of ever escaping again would be extinguished as Mexico approved an extradition request to the United States. Safely in U.S. custody, El Chapo faces life in prison, and though he may have been one of the deadliest men in Mexico's history, the drug kingpin would ultimately be remembered as nothing more than a sobbing mess as he begged U.S. justice officials for leniency, which they would not grant. It takes a couple of attempts, but you manage to spark up a lighter and hold it up steadily in front of your face to light up a joint. A familiar woody smell fills the room and drifts out of your window on the afternoon breeze. You blink, steady yourself, inhale deeply, and fill your lungs up with warmth. But what happens next? Chemically speaking, biologically speaking, what is it about this little green plant that gets millions of people around the world to flock to it? How long has humanity been consuming it? And what exactly is it doing inside your body, inside your mind? To start, let's have a look at the chemical composition of the cannabis plant itself rolled up in a joint in your hand. Native to Central and South Asia, the cannabis plant today is so popular it's now grown to be a global economy of its own, from small-scale rural farming operations all the way through to drug super labs, including any number of illegal weed farms somewhere in the middle. Experts believe that there are well over 700 different strains of cannabis currently on the market, and this number seems only set to increase. Being able to identify which strain of weed you have in your hand can be very easy when buying from a legal dispensary, but if you live in a country or a state where marijuana is still criminalized, being able to verify exactly what it is you're smoking becomes more difficult. Looking down at the green mossy balls in your hand, do you know where in the world it's come from and what's inside it? Let's break it down a bit, or rather, grind it down. 
you've likely heard of the two most well-known active ingredients in cannabis. These are cannabidiol and tetrahydrocannabinol, or as you probably know them, CBD and THC. Over the last 10 years in the West in particular, CBD has been championed as a potential medical breakthrough. It's also been shown to have a calming effect on those with anxious disorders and is currently being tested as a treatment for psychosis, sleep disorders, muscle spasticity, and more. You might have seen ads for CBD oil products popping up in your feed claiming that it can solve any number of ailments. Research is ongoing, however, results vary. In the case of curing cancer, for example, so far there's no evidence to support that CBD has any kind of effect on the disease, despite what people on the internet might be saying. So, you smoke CBD to get high, right? No, CBD is usually extracted as an oil, and on its own it will not get you high. But it's still psychoactive, meaning it alters your mental state, typically leaving you feeling more calm and mellow. The feeling of being high comes from the main active component in marijuana, THC. Typically found in much greater quantities than CBD, THC can have a powerful psychoactive effect. To see what that means in practice, let's follow it as it enters the human body. You take in a deep breath of that joint and let the smoke fill your lungs. In this example, you're going to be our test subject, and you will be smoking weed. Smoking is one of the most direct and quickest ways to get high. This is because the smoke from your burning marijuana contains high levels of THC. The smoke is then inhaled, filling your lungs. At this point, you might experience some irritation, manifesting in the iconic smoker's cough from introducing an alien substance into your lungs. This, however, is not unique to smoking weed, as you're likely to see the same from people smoking or vaping conventional tobacco. The lungs are designed to quickly and efficiently transfer oxygen into the bloodstream when we breathe. Therefore, they have the capacity to take in large quantities of gas in one breath and get any number of elements or compounds from that gas into our bloodstream and fast. The lungs aren't just empty chambers, they're full of tiny little air pockets called alveoli. The average human adult has roughly 480 million alveoli in their lungs, constituting about 1,500 miles of airways. That's the equivalent of driving from Miami to New Hampshire for our American viewers, or Madrid to Copenhagen for our European viewers. For everyone else, it's roughly 13,636,363.6 bananas lying end to end. Anyway, back to your lungs. In each alveolus, the THC from the smoke is transferred directly into your bloodstream which then carries it all over your body, including to the critical area, your brain. As a result, it often only takes a matter of seconds for the user to start feeling the psychoactive effects of what they're smoking. So let's crack your head open and see what's going on inside. Sorry, this might hurt a little. The THC and CBD bind themselves to receptors throughout your brain. The amygdala, for example, is responsible for anxiety, emotional responses, and fear. CBD dulls the activity in this part of the brain, but the THC component can stimulate it. While many users feel calmer after having smoked weed, others can feel a heightened sense of paranoia and worry, particularly on the come down as the calming effects of the CBD wear off. Looking at other parts of the brain impacted by the CBD, we have the basal ganglia, which is involved with motor control and planning, the neocortex, which processes sensory information, and the cerebellum, which is the center of motor control. All three of these areas are impacted by smoking weed, resulting in you feeling slower in general. Reflexes are delayed, information takes more time to process, and motor functions and speech slow down. Driving under the influence of marijuana can be very dangerous as a result. One study in the UK found that fatal accidents are 1.65 times more likely to occur when the subject is under the influence of marijuana, while another study in Canada found that accidents could be to four times as likely. Most countries have strict laws for driving under the influence of weed with zero tolerance policies, made stricter by the fact that it can take over 48 hours for weed to stop showing up on a blood test. If they're testing your saliva, it can be up to 72 hours. Urine can be anywhere from 3 to 30 days, and it can even be tested in your hair follicles for up to 90 days. Fortunately, you won't find many traffic cops that are plucking out your arm hair for a routine traffic stop. However, it would be reductive to think that all weed does is dull your brain. THC is a very active component that stimulates a lot of neural activity. Colors look brighter, sounds are louder, music sounds more rich and layered. Food often tastes better under the influence of THC, giving the subject the illusion that they're really hungry. That's right, this is why so many people using cannabis experience the famous munchies, which is why having a stoner visit your home is potentially extremely dangerous to the state of your snack pantry and chip supply. Many people report having heightened imagination, being able to think outside the box or come up with fresh and exciting ideas. Artists all throughout history have partaken in recreational drugs, 
in an attempt to broaden their horizons, dulling a lot of the negative sensations such as feeling pain and anxiety, coupled with the stimulation from THC, results in feelings of euphoria. In short, you, our human test subject, have gotten high. But what does this high actually look like? Here's where it gets really interesting. Let's bandage your head up and take a look. So far, we've only focused on the THC and CBD, but there are hundreds of active components within cannabis, which vary in quantity and intensity depending on which of the hundreds of strains the user is consuming. On top of that, there's the method of consumption. While smoking or vaping gets the chemicals into the bloodstream quickly, the high only lasts around three hours or so. Many users instead take gummies or bake brownies and cookies. When weed is absorbed through the digestive system, it takes a significantly longer time to kick in, but when it does, the user can experience highs that go on for hours, even up to a day, as the digestive system slowly releases the chemicals into the bloodstream. All of this makes studying the effects of marijuana very difficult. As with almost any study, there are the caveats of which strain is being used, how the test subject is ingesting it, and who the test subject is. The human brain is an incredibly complex thing indeed. If you took a sample of the human brain that was the size of just one grain of sand, that sample would contain 100,000 neurons and 1 billion synapses. Now multiply that by 860,000 and you've got a human brain, just like the one that's sitting in your head, watching this video and feeling very smug about itself. Being able to quantify and measure exactly what's happening in an organ far more advanced and complicated than the computers we're studying it on has been a challenge in medical science for decades and will likely continue to be one for a very long time. While one individual might take one puff and spend the rest of the day feeling anxious, their elderly grandma might smoke a whole bowl and feel nothing but zen. So, for Nana's sake, is it dangerous? Well, on the whole, consuming marijuana is relatively harmless as long as you aren't driving, controlling heavy machinery, or performing open-heart surgery, the risks of smoking the occasional joint with the right amount of weed in it are low. So, why hasn't it been legalized worldwide already? And why are there skeptics out there, including in the scientific community? As is often the case with controversial topics, a lot of the conflict comes from political and cultural differences. To tell that whole story, we need to wind all the way back to China in 2800 BC, where we find the first recorded use of marijuana in history. Even that long ago, the cannabis plant was being used for medicinal purposes. Emperor Shen Nong, considered by many to be the grandfather of medicine, recorded the plant in his writings as being particularly useful. From that point, records of cannabis spread throughout India, Syria, Greece, and Rome. Various healing properties have been ascribed to it over the years, including cures for inflammation, depression, arthritis, and even asthma. Of course, most early medicine is notoriously rather unreliable. We're looking at you leeches and milk transfusions. But there's always been something about this little green plant that's captured the attention of doctors and pharmacologists throughout the centuries. Often, there's a grain of truth to the mythology that has sprung up around the drug. In Hinduism, for example, the god Shiva is given the title of Lord of Bong because cannabis is his favorite food. For centuries, many Hindus believed that if you were suffering from a fever, it was the god's hot breath of anger upon you. Rituals were conducted where you would be given a quantity of cannabis to consume so you would find favor with Shiva again and your fever would pass. With modern medical science, we know that THC acts in the hypothalamus of the brain, reducing the body's temperature and therefore counteracting fevers. So, where did it all go wrong for Weed's PR team? Why is it that many people in the West now include cannabis in the same conversation as crack, cocaine, and heroin, as opposed to paracetamol and penicillin? Well, medical marijuana was first introduced in the West in 1841 by William Brooke O'Shaughnessy, an Irish physician who spent years studying all kinds of different medicines in India. But the real origins of the USA's problem with marijuana began 200 years before that, in the Jamestown colony in 1605. Dissatisfied with the return on investment they were seeing, the English, and King James I in particular, demanded the colony change up the crop they produced to hemp, a plant within the cannabis family. The crop was a massive success and became the key to the early expansion of the American colonial settlements. George Washington himself famously grew hemp as one of his three primary crops on Mount Vernon. The plant was used to manufacture ropes and fabrics, but following William Brooke O'Shaughnessy's findings from India, Americans began to experiment with the plant's medicinal properties. The USA was still in relative infancy, with many laws and prohibitions being established. Drug laws at the time involved labeling products as being poisons, which restricted them to being legal only if prescribed by a pharmacist. Even then, the debate about cannabis varied from state to state, with some issuing it with the poison status and others believing it was exempt from these rules. 
At the time, opium dens were rife across America, and alongside them a number of hashish parlors popped up in which people would smoke various forms of hemp and cannabis. By 1880, these establishments were seen as quite fashionable, with many of the upper classes frequenting them. It's estimated that there were roughly 500 such parlors in New York City alone. The laws needed to be strengthened further still. Fraud and corruption were rife in the drug industry, with many falsely labeling their products for the sake of profit. The tighter that these restrictions got, the more people looked for loopholes. The government and the newly established Food and Drug Administration were pulling in different directions than a lot of the American public, who were looking to skirt prescriptions and drug laws in order to continue to get their highs. In the move to close the loopholes, cannabis was often grouped in with many of the much more addictive, much more harmful drugs that were plaguing the American population. The solution the American government came to was a zero-tolerance policy on recreational drug use, including the prohibition of alcohol and the criminalization of marijuana, which at the time they were spelling with an H. In 1971, President Nixon coined the term War on Drugs, where he declared drug abuse to be public enemy number one of the American people. The approach was incarceration with an iron fist. Possession, distribution, and consumption of banned substances would result in jail time. It's estimated that throughout this war on drugs, the USA spends roughly $51 billion annually on its endeavor to clean up the streets. To illustrate with that money, the USA could give each Canadian citizen $1,416.67 per year just as a little thank you for being such lovely neighbors. Alternatively, they could give one lucky Canadian a dollar a minute for 97,032 years. A large amount of this campaign against drugs has involved a level of fear-mongering. There's a lot of false information swirling around the world about the negative effects these drugs have. It rots the brain and causes psychosis. It's a gateway drug to stronger and more dangerous highs, and it is highly addictive. But is there any truth to any of these claims? Let's examine them one by one. Firstly, no, marijuana does not rot the brain. Rotting is the decay of dead organic material as bacteria and fungi consume it. That simply doesn't happen. However, the link to psychosis is a much more contested field with evidence for both sides of the argument. Firstly, what is psychosis? It's a term that is thrown around a lot, especially in the world of drug use, but very rarely defined, meaning a lot of people attach their own fears, worries, and prejudices to the word. Psychosis is when someone loses contact with reality. The image of the world around them that the brain is painting doesn't match up with the objective reality surrounding them. The two main symptoms of psychosis are hallucinations and delusions, and it's important to know the difference between the two. A hallucination is when a person experiences something that isn't actually happening. Most commonly, this takes the form of hearing voices that aren't really there or sometimes seeing things that aren't really there. In some cases, people have reported smelling, feeling, and tasting their hallucinations too, such as tasting blood in their mouth despite there being none. A delusion, on the other hand, is more abstract. It could be the feeling that you're being followed or that there's a conspiracy in your workplace to harm you. Delusional people are often highly susceptible to conspiracy theories, as often the paranoid messaging chimes with their fearful delusions that their minds have already been generating. So, does marijuana cause psychosis? It's complicated. Let's go back to the chemicals active in your brain. We're gonna need to crack that skull open again, sorry. THC is highly psychoactive. This is where the feeling of euphoria from being high comes from. While CBD can decrease the levels of panic and paranoia in the brain, it's often present in much smaller quantities than THC, mainly as many cannabis farms compete with one another to grow stronger and stronger strains. Couple that with the fact that there are hundreds of active compounds within the cannabis plant, and it goes back to our earlier point about this being a challenging area of study. Therefore, many scientists rely on quite broad studies, taking large sample sizes of drug users and non-drug users and comparing the development of their brains over time, looking most notably at teenagers and young people. What they found is there is often a link between heavy pot smoking and psychosis. There are cases of people living with schizophrenia and bipolar disorders where the heavy use of marijuana is linked to the onset of those symptoms. What has not been proven, however, is that weed was the cause. Most scientists believe that weed can, in some cases, accelerate the development of underlying psychotic disorders. The brain is a very complex and delicate thing. If somebody has an underlying psychotic condition, then the consumption of drugs that alters their state of mind and heightens activities within certain sections of the brain can naturally lead to an exacerbation of those symptoms. Schizophrenia is believed to affect 1 in 300 people, while bipolar disorder affects 1 in 100. 
While these are quite small percentages, they are not insignificant. THC does carry the risk of triggering a psychotic episode if you're genetically predisposed to having a psychotic condition. The chances are very low and won't affect the majority of the population, but they are still there. Next, is it a gateway drug? The experience of a chemical buzz in the brain is a sensation that many of us try to chase in our lives. You get up and sing in a concert at your high school and you get a rush from it. You do it a second time and the high is worn off a bit. So you need a bigger crowd and a bigger crowd and suddenly you're in a rock band on an arena tour. Chasing this type of bigger, better high is an experience we're sure many of you are familiar with. Studies have shown that in a minority of cases, the same can happen with marijuana. Usage of the drug can prime the brain ready for more intense highs, which it then craves. This sounds bad until you realize the same thing happens with cigarettes and alcohol. Both of these demonstrate a similar connection to being a gateway drug to harder substances as marijuana. So why are those not held up to the same level of scrutiny? One thing studies have shown is that there is a much more powerful gateway drug out there, trauma. A difficult childhood, experiencing abuse, and going through acute pain and suffering are all far more likely to result in a person developing a dependence on hard substances. Weed is often a part of that journey, but in these cases it seems to be a symptom more than the cause of the problem. But is it addictive? Let's take a similar look at this question. You wake up one morning feeling tired, so you make yourself a cup of coffee. It clears away the fog, helps you focus on your job, and gives you a little endorphin rush from a good day's work. So the next day, you do the same, and the next, and the next, until one day you run out of coffee. You look in the jar and it's empty. A storm cloud gathers over your head. You go to work with a scowl, snap at your coworkers, have a headache by lunchtime, and come home feeling miserable. What's happened here? Well, the human brain is incredibly flexible. Your brain has gotten so used to the influx of caffeine each day that it's now rebalanced the chemicals inside itself to receive that caffeine boost. It's ready and it's waiting, so when the boost doesn't come, there's now a chemical imbalance. The same thing happens with weed. If you burn one down at 420, smoke weed every day, your brain's going to be sitting there at 419 rubbing its metaphorical hands together in anticipation. Coming off weed now feels hard. You have cravings for it, you feel irritated when you don't have it. You struggle to fall asleep, you lose your appetite, and you generally have a bad time. For about two weeks. Then you're likely back to normal. And that's because what we've described here isn't an addiction, it's dependence. It's very common and can be broken fairly quickly. Up to 30% of weed smokers experience some level of dependence, and it can be overcome by just taking an extended break and giving your brain some rest. That said, there's a small risk of long-term addiction. People under the age of 18 have brains that are still developing. They're still growing and changing and adjusting to the world around them. Smoking weed regularly at this stage in your life could lead your brain to building itself around the expectation that it'll be receiving those chemical hits every day, which may start as a dependence and could grow to be much more deeply rooted and could result in a lifelong addiction. If there's one thing you learned from this video, it's that marijuana, much like life, is complicated. There may not always be a straight answer to every question. Anyone who tells you that something is totally amazing and has no downsides will always be lying. Even ice cream has downsides. What's important is looking at the big picture. Is weed the devil's leaf that spells the end of society as we know it? No, of course not. But neither is it a miracle cure-all drug that everyone should take on a daily basis. For almost 10 years, the United States had been tirelessly searching for one man, Osama bin Laden, the terrorist mastermind behind the September 11th attacks that killed almost 3,000 Americans and triggered a war that was still raging today, May 2, 2011. While the United States had toppled the Taliban, the government that was sheltering bin Laden at the time of the attacks, they had never been able to capture or kill the man. That was about to change. The CIA had been searching for bin Laden's secret base for years with no luck. He had managed to escape from Afghanistan, which was under U.S. occupation, and travel to the neighboring country of Pakistan. But in the mountains, rural regions of Pakistan, with little government oversight, it was easy for him to stay under the radar. The government had been looking for leads for years, but finally got their break in 2010, when their leads led them to a compound in Abbottabad. They began taking surveillance footage of the compound and determining the best way to breach it. What followed was one of the trickiest intelligence gathering operations in U.S. history. The compound was heavily guarded and in enemy territory. The U.S. had to rely heavily on local help to gather intelligence and over a period of months they spied on the three-story building. They learned every detail about the building but a lot was still missing. For one thing, the infamous terror leader was incredibly secretive, so secretive that they were never able to capture an image of him coming in or out of the building, so everything was still circumstantial. 
but after an extended period of time, they were able to conclude that this was where Osama bin Laden was. Now it was time to take action. It was April 29th when President Obama was briefed on the details of the operation. Many within his security team were skeptical about the operation. After all, if it went wrong, top US troops would either be killed or remain trapped behind enemy lines. Not only would this be a disastrous loss of life, but it would potentially expose many of the US's biggest secrets if they were interrogated and forced to reveal classified info. And with the doubts that bin Laden truly was in the compound, many didn't feel it was worth the risk. Ultimately, the president disagreed, and he gave the okay to the operation that would become Operation Neptune Spear. And the people carrying it out would be the best of the best. Meet SEAL Team 6, an elite squadron of the highly trained Navy SEALs. They answer directly to the Joint Special Operations Command and carry out some of the most highly classified operations in the US government. These include hostage rescue, special espionage missions, counterterrorism, targeting of enemy infrastructure, and direct action against the deadliest of US enemies, like Osama bin Laden. They would be briefed on the mission, which would be classified as capture or kill. Officially, the US has the policy of never killing an enemy who had already surrendered, but no one involved in the mission had any delusion that Osama bin Laden would ever surrender. And to pull this off, they had to implement some risky strategies. The planning had been going on for the better part of a year, since the intelligence reports started coming in and many strategies had been considered. The easiest would have been a joint operation with Pakistani military forces, but the Pakistani government wasn't exactly friendly, and the US was worried that bin Laden could be tipped off in advance. The US also considered striking at the compound with stealth bombers, which could atomize bin Laden, but there would be no way of following up to ensure he was already dead, and the tricky terror leader had managed to escape US operations before. So instead, the government decided to go old school. SEAL Team 6 would be flown in using modified Black Hawk helicopters that were designed to be quiet and would be able to fly in under enemy radar. The Pakistani military had been heavily trained and supplied by US advisors, so their capabilities were known and the US was confident they could get around them. The goal was to get to the compound without being detected or challenged by the Pakistani forces, and once the target was down, they would be able to beat a hasty retreat. May 1st, 1.22 PM, Defense Secretary Leon Panetta received word from the President and directed Admiral William McRaven to move ahead with the operation. Within the next two hours, President Obama and his national security team would move to the Situation Room to watch the whole thing unfold over night vision images transmitted to them from a drone. The roughly 24 Navy SEALs sent on the mission would temporarily be transferred to the control of the CIA, so it would technically not be a military mission and would not be classified as an act of war. These were going to be some of the most critical minutes in the US's modern history, and for the men on the ground, every single minute would count. While the roughly two dozen SEALs were the ones who would breach the compound, there were 79 commandos and a dog involved in the raid. The dog, a Belgian Malinois named Cairo, was there to alert the SEALs to any sudden activity, including the Pakistani military approaching the compound or anyone trying to escape. The core team was backed up by a dog handler, interpreters, pilots, intelligence agents, and tech experts who would make it all possible. But the success or failure of the mission would hinge on the men entering the compound, and one wrong move could spell doom. 3.30 AM, give or take. Two helicopters descend on the Abbottabad compound, while the other helicopters stand by in case they're needed. These two will carry out the primary mission. Flying low to the ground, the stealthy Black Hawk helicopters hover over the compound grounds. While the first deploys ropes to lower its team to the ground, the other heads to the far northeast corner to covertly drop off its interpreter, dog, handler, and four seals. If everything went smoothly, they would soon be at the compound. But everything didn't go smoothly. While the helicopters weren't detected and they didn't come under hostile fire, Mother Nature had something to say. The first helicopter flew into what's known as a vortex ring state, an air phenomenon caused by a higher than expected temperatures creating an air vortex. The rotor's air pressure didn't diffuse properly, the helicopter was knocked off balance, and it grazed the back of the compound wall. The tail rotor was seriously damaged, and the helicopter started rolling over. The quick-thinking pilot drove the helicopter into the ground nose-first, preventing a total collapse, and the SEALs and crew were able to escape unscathed after a rough landing. Now the only question was, had this blown their secret mission? The answer seemed to be no, as there was no sign of aggression from the compound. The SEALs had successfully weathered a crash landing without being detected. The helicopter was secure against the compound walls, and the other helicopter had landed safely outside the compound. The rest of the team was scaling the walls, and the whole team was reunited. The next step was breaching the compound, and that's where the SEALs' explosives team came in. They needed to get in quickly and hit people inside with shock and awe. Outside preparation was key, but once they were inside, every second would count. Ten years of searching had come down to this. 3.33 AM 
To get through the security, the SEALs used portable explosives to blow open the doors of the compound's guest house one by one. They breached the compound and began storming up the stairs. The first room they encountered on the first floor contained two adult males, but neither was Osama bin Laden. They were detained, but they weren't the target. More disturbing, every floor seemed to contain small groups of children. This wasn't just a terrorist compound, it was home where the terrorists kept their families, regardless of the danger they were putting them in. And with every floor the SEALs ascended, the danger would escalate. 335. What happened next? Reports of that may vary. As they reached the second floor, they encountered more resistance. This is where bin Laden's courier, Abu Ahmed al Kuwaiti, was found, and SEAL Mark Owen would controversially write a book on the firefight. He claimed that al Kuwaiti was armed and fired on the SEALs. While one SEAL was lightly injured, they returned fire and killed the evil courier. However, intelligence sources later said that the SEALs were able to get the drop on the man after cutting power to the compound and eliminated him without him fighting back. What was clear is that they still hadn't encountered the man himself. 337. It was time to ascend once again, and the resistance became fiercer the further the SEALs headed into the house. They'd encountered the courier, as well as his brother and wife, and all enemies had either been killed or captured. As they ascended the staircase, they encountered another enemy, and this one provided a glimmer of hope. After the Al-Qaeda soldier was killed, the SEALs identified him as a son of Osama bin Laden, one of the terror leader's many progenies who followed in his footsteps. And if he was there, odds were good his father wasn't far away. 339. There was only one floor left to be breached, the third, and the SEALs were stealing themselves for yet another disappointment. This was clearly a high-level Al-Qaeda compound, but bin Laden had been notorious for staying one step ahead of his pursuers, and he could be far away by now. But as they breached the third floor, it became clear this time was different. In the third floor's main room was Osama bin Laden, seemingly unarmed and wearing the loose-fitting tunic he was usually seen wearing in his many propaganda videos. The SEALs got their first glimpse of him as he stuck his head out of the bedroom and they didn't miss their opportunity. They immediately fired, wounding him. However, he was able to retreat back into the bedroom, and the SEALs pursued. The room was revealed to contain many of bin Laden's female relatives, including several of his wives. One approached the SEALs as if she were charging, and the SEALs quickly shot her to wound, grabbing her and advancing further toward the terror leader. Osama bin Laden had nowhere left to run, and America's most skilled soldiers were right outside his door. What happens next? Reports vary. Matt Bissonnette, one of the SEALs on site, claims that bin Laden had been mortally wounded by the initial shots as they approached. His wives were trying to protect him, and the SEALs were forced to act as any one of them could have an explosive device. But when they pushed past them, they found bin Laden on the ground, mortally wounded. As he moved, they fired multiple shots and neutralized the terror leader for good. But another SEAL had a very different story. Robert J. O'Neill would become one of the first SEALs to identify himself as one of the men on the mission and had a much more dramatic recollection of the events. In his retelling, Osama bin Laden might have been wounded, but he was far from neutralized. In fact, he was strong enough to grab one of the women in the room and hide behind her, using her as a human shield. As bin Laden pushed the hapless woman toward the seals, O'Neill quickly fired two shots directly into bin Laden's forehead and killed him. Which report was accurate? The Navy After Action Report favors Bissonnette's retelling. And just like that, one of the most notorious enemies of the United States was no more. The SEAL team radioed back, forgotten country Geronimo Geronimo Geronimo, officially confirming that the enemy had been killed in action. The entire affair had taken less than 15 minutes from landing to the elimination of Osama bin Laden, one of the most efficient operations in US military history, and had been completed without a single death or serious injury to the entire Navy SEAL team. Watching from the Situation Room, President Obama uttered the words the entire White House team had been waiting to hear. We got him. But the mission wasn't over just yet. 355. The SEAL team members quickly sprung into action, securing bin Laden's body and moving it downstairs. They would be exiting shortly, but there was still some extensive cleanup work to do. The compound might be a source of vital intelligence, and they thoroughly searched the room and surrounding area. They found two weapons in the room, an assault rifle and a pistol, but the efficient team had managed to neutralize bin Laden before he could reach them. They weren't loaded, indicating the Al-Qaeda leader was not expecting a firefight. But what to do about the other residents? Almost everyone who had engaged the US troops with weapons had been killed, but the compound was full of civilians. The US had no desire to take all the women and children found there into custody, so they non-violently restrained them and left them outside the compound to be found by Pakistani forces. Most didn't put up any resistance, besides the injured wife of bin Laden, Amal Ahmed Abdul Fattah. She berated the SEALs in Arabic for the entire duration of the cleanup mission, and it seemed the Yemeni woman was a true believer in her late husband's mission. She, like most of the people found there, would eventually be deported from Pakistan back to their home countries in the Middle East. And now it was time to make a clean getaway. 405. 
Bin Laden's body and every important piece of intelligence or evidence had been secured. Taking what they needed, the first helicopter was loaded and primed for takeoff. Much like the landing, this was a low takeoff to avoid detection. For those back in the US, the SEALs were heroes, but this was an unauthorized mission, and it was unlikely the Pakistani forces would be grateful if they were caught there. But much like the first time, SEAL Team 6 pulled off a perfect getaway and exited the compound. But there was one more matter to attend to. 408. The damaged Black Hawk helicopter that crashed into the compound would not be leaving through the sky, and Pakistani forces would be there shortly. The chopper contained vital information about US military capabilities, because it wasn't just a standard helicopter and had been outfitted with stealth features. So before they departed, the troops used the same portable explosives like the one they'd used to breach the compound and gave their fallen chopper an explosive send-off. This only took minutes, and soon one of the backup helicopters brought on the mission arrived, scooping up the remaining SEALs and flew them off to join the first helicopter. The mission was over, and now it was time for a long ride. 553. The ride back was over an hour and a half, more than three times the length of the mission that killed Osama bin Laden. But now that it was over, they had to get back to safe territory, back in US-occupied Afghanistan, where the Americans had been fighting since the days after September 11th terror attacks. While it was unlikely the Pakistanis would fire on a US chopper if it was detected, a stealthy escape would go much smoother. So the US troops had some disinformation efforts. As the various explosions led to crowds before takeoff, an Urdu-speaking American military officer claimed it had been a Pakistani operation being carried out at the compound and to keep their distance. It worked, and the Americans landed safely at Bagram Airfield, carrying the body of Osama bin Laden. Now it was time to deal with the aftermath. 701. Back at the White House, the celebration was tempered by one question. Was it really him? Bin Laden was infamous for using body doubles, and there had been multiple times where it was thought he had been killed, only for it to turn out to be a feint. So everyone waited anxiously for the results of the preliminary examinations of the corpse, and over an hour after the SEALs arrived in Afghanistan, a new report came in indicating that the notorious rogue was actually dead. This time, the United States had gotten their man, and the American public was about to find out. It was the evening of May 1st when word started going around that the president was going to be making a speech on TV that night. Usually, when Barack Obama made a planned speech, it was early in the evening during prime time, often to the annoyance of everyone who was trying to watch their favorite TV show. But this unplanned speech on short notice was different, and political watchers kept waiting until the president ascended the podium at less than half an hour to midnight. And as soon as he opened his mouth, people knew this was big. 11.35 Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda and a terrorist who is responsible for the murder of thousands of innocent men, women, and children. As the president paid tribute to the many who died in bin Laden's terror attacks, a spontaneous celebration erupted around the country. It was just short of 10 years since the September 11th terror attacks, and many Americans lived in fear of the next attack. As word got around, large groups of fans attending sports games screamed in joy. Democrats exulted in the biggest foreign policy win of the Obama presidency, and Republicans celebrated the end of an enemy while wondering if they should even bother running against him next year. And there was only one thing left to do. 1259. It was a little over an hour after President Obama's speech and the troops had one major piece of business left to attend to. What to do with Osama bin Laden's body? The terror leader had been fully tested and examined, and they were sure he was their guy. He had been checked for any vital intel and the body had no more secrets to give up. The only thing left to do was dispose of the body, but there was one problem with that. No one wanted him. Bin Laden was wanted in just about every country on the planet, and even countries where he had sought refuge, Pakistan and Afghanistan, considered him an outlaw. No country would want to give him a grave, because it would be a massive target for radical activity. No one wants to have an Al-Qaeda pilgrimage in your country every year, so why not just cremate his body and be done with it? cremation is against Islamic tradition, and as hated as the terror leader was, the government still wanted to respect his faith. No need to anger his followers any more than they already were, given that their leader had just been eliminated. Fortunately, there was an alternative. Bin Laden's body was loaded onto the aircraft carrier Carl Vinson, and the US government called the government of Saudi Arabia for approval to dispose of the body. He was a Saudi citizen, after all, and the Saudis were important allies of the US government at the time. And the Saudi response was, we don't care what you do with him, just don't make it our problem. The plan to bury Osama bin Laden at sea was approved, and the body was treated with Muslim religious rites. There was even a brief reading of Arabic religious statements, at which point the body was draped in a white shroud, placed in a bag loaded with hundreds of pounds of iron chains, and placed on a wooden board. As the board was tilted forward, bin Laden's body slipped into the sea. 
ensuring the terror leader would never have a grave that could be visited by loyalists or targeted by enemies. And now that the entire operation was over, there was only the cleanup to attend to. It was roughly 3 a.m. local time in Pakistan when the army chief received a phone call informing the country of the operation that took place in their borders. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff filled him in on the details and likely smoothed over some angry words. While there was some brief dispute of whether any Pakistani forces had been involved, the government denied this, and reports stated that the Pakistani planes which scrambled to the location had only arrived after the U.S. forces had departed. This is not where the aftermath ended, though. The raid that killed Osama bin Laden had played out over less than an hour, but the follow-up would span years. Controversy centered around the legality of the raid on foreign soil. Although the laws passed after 9-11 gave the U.S. wide latitude to eliminate threats abroad, Pakistan wasn't pleased with the U.S. operating on their soil, and the U.S. wanted to know more about bin Laden's network of support in Pakistan. Neither got too many answers. Conspiracy theories persisted about bin Laden's being alive, although the U.S. government releasing some photos of the terror leader's corpse largely put those to rest. And there was one more inevitable act. Once the operation was partially declassified, various members of the team started putting out memoirs. Some varied in details, and most made the person writing the book out to be the hero. So naturally, it wasn't long before Hollywood came calling. Only a year and a half after the death of Osama bin Laden, the movie Zero Dark Thirty was released, and its pick for the hero was a fictional intelligence analyst played by Jessica Chastain. Because it wouldn't be a key moment in American history without Hollywood putting its own spin on it. At the time of writing, there are 2,738 inmates on death row in the United States. This number can change quite frequently, given that some prisoners of course might be executed, but others might have their sentence commuted. They might have their sentence overturned, or someone else might join them on death row. Right now, only 2% of people on death row are women. 42% of people are classified as white, 41% black, 13% Latino, 1.9% Asian, 1% Native American, and the rest is stated as unknown. You can be on death row for a long, long time. And believe it or not, the average time spent there from sentencing to the day in the execution chamber is 20 years. Let's now see what happens on that final day. 8 p.m. The inmate is taken from death row to another cell. This involves a drive from the prison to what one former official in a documentary called the Death House. That official said prior to leaving death row and getting in the van to come to the death house, the inmate will be searched really well. He said this wasn't only because a weapon might harm a guard, but mainly because they don't want the prisoner committing suicide. Another guard interviewed said he once took a route to the death house where they couldn't be ambushed. Tensions are high during these events. He also said the atmosphere in the van was solemn. We all knew where we were going and why. Nobody said a whole lot. Once the prisoner goes into the death house, he won't ever see the light of day again, unless some kind of appeal works for him. 9 p.m. After booking in, he can sleep until he's awakened, if indeed he can sleep. We managed to find the diary of one prisoner who described his move to his new cell. They stripped me out with a female officer present, he wrote. Now, personally, I'm not the shy type, but having a female officer on death watch is just one more humiliation. We're told that during this time, the prisoner is on something called death watch. He's watched all the time in case he tries to take his own life. The cell is close to the execution chamber and it is very private, a space where the inmate can reflect on life as the hours count down. This might happen just one day before, but we found cases where it was a couple of days. Prisoners will also be given special clothes in most cases, much smarter than prison attire. The man who kept the diary wrote he was happy to have at last a pair of trousers with a button and zip. We don't know how well he slept, but in his diary he comments about watching the guards sleep. This is what he wrote, good for them, I'm sure this has to be stressful for them. So a moment's relaxation is well earned. I also enjoy the irony, who exactly is watching whom? One other thing he says is that the death house is much cleaner than his death row cell. He remarks that there's not a bug in sight, whereas in his last cell it was like going on safari. 4.30 AM The inmate is woken up bright and early in his cell. We should add here times might change from place to place, petitions might still be pending, and there's a phone right outside the cell. In the cell, there's a shower, a toilet, a bed, and a desk. During this last day, the prisoner is allowed to see family and can be visited by a chaplain. As for calling people, the inmate can write down a list of phone numbers he intends to call and give that to the guards. One guard interviewed said we would dial the number for him and then allow him to make his call. But after the prisoner has called the last person on his list, the only person he'll have to talk to is the chaplain. 
We're told that after this last call, it can be a very traumatic time. One chaplain interviewed said, I was to do everything and anything to help him face that last day, whatever it was, writing letters, making phone calls, singing songs, listening, listening, and listening. 8 AM We said they can have visitors, but 8 AM is the cutoff time. After that, the prisoner is on his own, besides having prison staff around and, of course, anyone involved in his case should something change. The chaplain can still visit too. At around this time, in the actual death chamber, it's very likely that the equipment will be tested. This might mean checking that the straps on the gurney work or even checking the phone to the governor's office is working. Yep, imagine it wasn't and there was a last minute reprieve. If the form of execution is the chair, then its electrical components have to be tested. In one case we found, the actual governor was the person who they strapped in to test if he could get out or move out of the straps. I didn't want my staff to get kicked in the face, he remarked. 10.30 AM Now it's lunchtime. Yes, this is an early lunch, but let's not forget the inmate has been up a long time already. Lunch is not special, it's not the last meal. From what we can see, it's the same old prison food. The only difference is that the prisoner gets to eat it in a private setting. The inmate we talked about before said what he got for lunch was orange juice and what he called a prison issue donut. For quite a few hours now, the prisoner has a lot of time to think and as you know, they have a desk and can write any number of letters, goodbyes, or just reflect on life. 3 PM If the inmate is to get the electric chair, he'll have his head shaved around this time. But this might also happen later in the day. He might still talk to a spiritual advisor, but food might also be on his mind right now. Around this time, maybe an hour or so later, the inmate will also be asked to dress in one of those smart clothes he's been given. He'll be asked to take a shower before he does this, a shower at least in total privacy. He'll have already written down what he wants to eat, so in the kitchen the death house chef will be doing all the preparations. 4 PM The inmate will receive his last meal. Contrary to popular belief, inmates can't just order what they want. It makes sense, because it's highly unlikely that authorities would splash out on the finest Wagyu beef. In Florida, for instance, the maximum this last meal can cost is 40 bucks, but this will change from state to state. Those poor convicts over in Oklahoma only get a limit of $15, or at least when one documentary we watched was made. That is hardly enough to go crazy on your last meal. It's still good though. As one death house chef pointed out, this meal is the only choice of food they might have had in two decades. In some states though, prisoners no longer get a bespoke last meal and only get the usual prison food. To give you an idea of what inmates might choose, we will list some last meals. Serial killer John Wayne Gacy had 12 fried shrimp, an entire bucket of KFC, some french fries, and a whole load of strawberries. The man behind the Oklahoma bombing, Timothy McVeigh, just opted for two pints of mint chocolate chip ice cream. A killer from Florida called Angel Nieves Diaz chose absolutely nothing. The terrible Ted Bundy did pretty much the opposite, ordering a steak cooked medium rare, eggs on the side, over easy, some hash browns, slices of toast, and some milk and juice. The infamous female serial killer Eileen Warnos was good with just a cup of coffee, while a murderer called Stephen Woods must have been famished. We should add that many thought he was innocent and his last words were, you're not about to witness an execution, you're about to witness a murder. Before that, he asked to eat, according to the website Ranker, two pounds of bacon, a large four-meat pizza, four fried chicken breasts, two drinks each of Mountain Dew, Pepsi, root beer, and sweet tea, two pints of ice cream, five chicken fried steaks, two hamburgers with bacon, fries, and a dozen garlic breadsticks with marinara on the side. That state must have had a big budget. 5 PM The witnesses will likely arrive at the prison. This might be family of the victims, journalists, family of the condemned, friends of the condemned, or whoever the condemned has asked to be witnesses. They will be told to try and stay quiet when they reach the witness room. Before that, they'll wait somewhere else. In most states, civilians who didn't know anyone involved will be asked to witness the execution. 6 to 8 PM the time of execution can vary from state to state, but it's just about always in the early evening. At this point, the prisoner will be taken to the execution room. The witnesses will soon be in the witness room. Prisoners, for the most part, will just walk right there and not give the guards any problems. In some states, this will be a five-man team, just in case there is a struggle. But that doesn't happen often. One warden interviewed who had done 89 executions said he'd only had one prisoner that was hard to deal with. The walk to the chamber in most places is only about 10 feet, just over 3 meters. The guys would usually walk right up to the electric chair. They weren't forced by the staff. By that point, they've already accepted what will happen. A former Death Watch guard told Business Insider, 
Another guard in a separate interview said the same. Inmates usually act very dignified. It's a very clean procedure, there's no hustling and bustling. It's not always this way, especially if the prisoner is protesting his innocence. In 2018, the BBC reported that one man in Florida was screaming and thrashing before he was executed, screaming to everyone that they were murdering an innocent man. One warden said the first thing that catches his eye is that gurney, which is the place he's going to die. If it is lethal injection, which it often is, the prisoner is told to sit on the gurney and then lay down. There will be a tie-down team, each responsible for a part of the prisoner's body. Doctors will usually not be at the execution because it's not in line with their code of ethics, so there will be a special team to administer the drugs. This is not always easy as the veins tend to hide during this stressful time. Some of them had burnt veins from drugs which would make the process longer and more painful, said one former warden. When the catheters are in place, the inmate will be secured again. There's about 15 minutes before the execution. Believe it or not, some inmates have got a stay, which means a call to stop the execution, during these last minutes. If that doesn't happen, the witnesses are brought into the main room and the curtains are undrawn. Some inmates might make a final statement. It depends on the state, but some prisoners might be given a few minutes, and others just allowed to make a brief statement. Kentucky gives two minutes, but in Pennsylvania you can't talk at all, and the statement can only be written. Here are some fairly recent examples of last words. I'm ready to roll, time to get this party started. My last words will be, Hoka hey, it's a good day to die. Somebody needs to kill my trial attorney. I think that governor's phone is broke, he hasn't called yet. These are, of course, unusual ones, and most people will just say their goodbyes to loved ones or give an apology for what they did. At this point, the chaplain might lay a hand on the prisoner, sometimes where there's a pulse. The warden will give the signal to the executioner, and then it's time. The end of the day, the end of a life. If you've already seen the 2008 movie Bronson, about Britain's so-called most notorious prisoner, don't worry. That rather theatrical piece of cinema didn't tell you much about the man, so there's so much more to see today. You might be thinking that it's coincidental that a man with such a reputation has the same name as a former Hollywood tough guy, but he wasn't called that at birth. The name was acquired during his bare-knuckle boxing days. He was actually born Michael Gordon Peterson. Yep, that doesn't sound quite as fearful. There's a lot of controversy about this man, regarding whether he should have been in prison for so long or if prison is to blame for his often crazy behavior. We discuss this and more in this episode of The Infographic Show, Britain's Most Notorious Prisoner, Charles Bronson. As you know, he was born with the name Michael. His birthday was December 6, 1952. He spent his first few years in Wales and then moved to Luton, which isn't too far away from the capital London. It doesn't seem that he came from a rough and tumble background, given that his father ran a conservative club for a while and his aunt and uncle were a mayor and mayoress. His aunt actually once said this about him, as a boy he was a lovely lad. He was obviously bright and always good with children. He was gentle and mild-mannered, never a bully. He would defend the weak. He might have defended the weak, but it seems his penchant for violence and crime started early in life. After he moved up north at the age of 13, it seems that that's when trouble started. At that age, he was charged as a juvenile for stealing, and it's said he was part of a gang. He didn't much enjoy school and soon left to start working at an early age. His first job came when he moved back down to Luton. This was a very short two-week stint working in Tesco supermarket. Apparently, he was fired for attacking his manager. After this, it seems, crime became second nature to young Michael. He got in trouble for criminal damage but got off with a fine and some probation. He had lots of jobs, mostly related to labor or factory work, and we're told he enjoyed nothing more than a good night out on the town drinking gallons of beer and getting into fist fights with the locals. Easy to do in some areas of the UK. He likely wasn't short of foes on the mean streets of Luton. One of his jobs, we're told, was a circus strongman, so he was likely a hard man to fight. He got in trouble again after crashing a stolen lorry or a truck into another car, but again got off with just a fine as no one was seriously hurt. At this point, he is still in his teens. Yet again, he got into trouble, and at this time aged 19, when he was involved in a smash and grab which is basically smashing a car into a shop front and getting as much as you can. Again, he got off with just a fine and a suspended sentence. Age 20, perhaps, he got his chance to join what is sometimes called the straight and narrow, as he met a girl and got married. But apparently, she quite liked his tough guy persona, his tailored suits, and the fact that he spoke in a Cockney accent. They had a child and called him Michael Jonathan Peterson. According to the British press, the son is very private and has never spoken publicly about his notorious dad. So, we can't tell you much about him. 
Moving on, now 22, Michael was arrested for armed robbery, and at this time the judge came down hard. He got seven years, but prison wasn't exactly a place he liked being, it seemed. During his first stint in prison in Liverpool, he attacked two other prisoners, and we're told he wasn't provoked. That got him time in solitary, something he would see much more of later. He was then transferred to prison in Hull, and again had issues with guards and prisoners. They gave him sedatives to calm him down, which apparently made him very ill. He also spent more time in isolation, and he was said to be a very difficult prisoner. On one occasion, he was out of solitary, he attacked a prisoner with a glass jug, and he was convicted of unlawful wounding. Yet again, he was moved, this time to the tough Armley Jail in Leeds, a foreboding looking place if you've ever seen one. So there he was, now serving time in what looks like a medieval castle. Even in 2018, the place is said to be the place with the highest rate of people taking their own lives, and in the press right now, it's said it's still very much an unsafe place for both prisoners and staff. Back in the 70s, it can't have been a holiday. But it seems he was too much for Armley, and he kept moving between a number of prisons, sometimes chained to the floor of the vans he traveled in. It's said if not in solitary, he would attack prisoners and guards. It's also said he incurred numerous vicious beatings from the guards after an attack. You might have seen that in the movie, which depicts these guards having to tackle him in numbers. During one time in solitary while recovering from a beating, he got divorced. We imagine this might have been a low point. But it's said that one thing that kept him going was his solitary workout routine, keeping him healthy and fearsome. His book, Solitary Fitness, which he wrote after many years inside, has sold millions of copies. Reviews are actually very positive, although people talk about how strange the book can get at times. Profits from the book, says the media, go to children's charities. The British press tells us that his strength was quite unbelievable. He once bent the cell bars with his own hands, and it's said he holds six world records for strength and fitness. Another unofficial record he has set is the most prison rooftop protests by any British inmates. But right now, we're still in the 70s and a long way from fame or infamy. While in prison in London, he tried to poison an inmate, and it seems that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Enough with prison, he was transferred to a psychiatric facility. But guess who he met there? Two of Britain's most ruthless gangsters, the Cray Twins. He called them the best two guys I ever met. That friendship didn't last long though, as he was moved back to prison. What followed was more solitary, escape attempts, attacks on prisoners that ended with lifelong scars, more attacks, and finally, when the authorities were sick and tired, he was sectioned under the Mental Health Act. He was no longer just a criminal, but mentally ill. In 1978, he was again in another special facility, but it seems he didn't much like being forced to take medication, and wasn't keen on the fact that he was surrounded by some of Britain's most disturbed people. Men who would never leave the facility because they had done things to people we will not talk about. Yep, he didn't like some of these terrible men, and at one point was said to be about five seconds away from killing a fellow patient or prisoner who had taken the life of an innocent child. In his own words, describing the people around him at the facility, I witnessed them running into walls, using their heads as rams. I've seen them fall unconscious doing this. There was one who just kept trying to eat himself, biting his arms, legs, and feet. He tried to kill another prisoner, and then in 1982, when still in the notorious Broadmoor, he led a rooftop protest that lasted three days and caused around $300,000 worth of damage. Now you can see why this guy became well known as a hard to deal with prisoner. But there was a lot more to come. He hadn't even started. He led two more rooftop protests and also went on a hunger strike, but in some ways he found solace in writing poems, sketching, and creating cartoon strips. He even won awards for his work. It didn't stop him being violent though, just settled him down from time to time. Psychiatrists couldn't figure him out. And even though he was in a mental facility, he was never properly diagnosed. He once said, asylums are crazy places with crazy rules. If you're not mad when you arrive, you are when you leave. Again, he was moved from facility to prison, stabbing inmates, hitting others. More rooftop protests, more isolation, more beatings from the guards, more medicine. And perhaps his piece de resistance, he once strangled a prison governor. After that, he was not allowed out of isolation until he finished his sentence. He got out of prison in 1987 and almost immediately turned to crime. Although his first offense was quite comical, he bought a water pistol and modified it a bit, after which he forced a man at Water Pistol Point to drive him to Luton, his favorite spot. There, he started bare-knuckle fighting and earned the nickname Charles Bronson. 
He actually legally changed his name to this. Was this the start of a life on the outside? Not a chance. It's written that he would fight anyone and even challenged the king of bare knuckle fighting, Lenny McLean. It seems Lenny wanted no part of him, or at least when he agreed to fight, it was too late as Bronson was back in prison. In another fight, he was challenged to go against a large Rottweiler. He killed it and said later in life that he really regretted that. It was cash in hand though. He was only out of prison months and was back inside again for armed robbery. We won't go into details, but he fought again, attacked prisoners, guards, and had more time in solitary, was moved and moved and moved, and occasionally tried to start riots. In 1989, he was attacked himself, stabbed in the back several times, but he recovered. He wouldn't tell the police anything about his attackers. In 1992, he got out for the grand total of 53 days. He was jailed but got off. Then he was arrested again for having a shotgun and conspiracy to rob. It gets crazy here, because while on the remand, he took a librarian as a hostage. While negotiating with police, he had three demands, an inflatable doll, a helicopter, and a cup of tea. Yep, you heard that right. He was given eight years despite saying the gun was to blow off his own head. It wasn't the first time he had contemplated taking his own life. He was difficult again, transferred from prisons, and at times was left naked for many days on end in dark isolation. At one point, he was put in the worst spot in any prison in the UK, something called the Hannibal Cage. That had been created for another prisoner who had once killed inmates and was said to have spooned out one person's brain and eaten it. Even though at one point he attacked a governor, it said he got much better after being allowed to interact with handicapped children. He also kept up his cartoon sketching. These were the quiet times. They didn't last long. He endured more solitary, more moves, and then in one prison he took two Iraqi hijackers as hostage in his cell. It's said he was going crazy after losing his father. It's also said that he told the guards if they came close he would snap off the heads of his hostages. He made his hostages tickle his feet and demanded they sing songs to him. To them he was known as the general. He demanded a plane, machine guns, ammunition, and a cheese and pickle sandwich. It seems later he just kept asking for ice cream. In the end, he let the hostages go and another seven years were added to his sentence. While in great physical shape, it's said that all the time in darkness and solitary had negative effects on his eyes and his social skills, and lawyers now started to get on his side. It's a pity then that he took one of them hostage. He let him go quickly though, but after one civilian worker criticized his drawings, he took him hostage too, and then started ripping up parts of the prison. Hmm, what else? Well, after the millennium, he got married again, converted to Islam, changed his name and took another hostage, wrote a book, sketched a lot, and then changed his name to Charles Arthur Charlie Salvador, out of respect for his favorite artist. The movie came out and he became a household name. Until then, not many people knew about him. Thousands of people around the world started to support him, saying even though he had been a bad boy, his incarceration had just gone on too long. But he couldn't stop messing up. In 2014, he attacked another governor. That same year, his artwork went up for auction, and his 200 pieces, often dark in nature, fetched around 30,000 pounds. Bronson donated a large part of this to the brain tumor charity and Keech Hospice in Lutton. Bronson said the old him was now dead, and he was born again as the artist Salvador. He created more works too, donating to other charities and one time Oxford's homeless. He also got married to an actress in 2017, and she's hoping to see him out soon. In total, out of the 44 plus years he served, 36 of them have been in solitary confinement sometimes without light. In 2018, it was said that he is in open prison, but will have his case reviewed in two years and could get out. That might not happen though, as he's got a life sentence for one of his kidnappings. That was a teacher in 1999 that he held for two days. The British media reports that he allegedly smothered himself in butter, age 65, and challenged the guards to a fight. We'll leave you with something he once said, I'm a nice guy, but sometimes I lose all my senses and become nasty. That doesn't make me evil, just confused. Usually, waking up because you have to go to the bathroom is annoying, but on May 26, 2013, waking up and leaving his bunk to use the bathroom was a decision that saved 29-year-old Harrison Ojegba Okene's life. Through an odd twist of fate, Harrison ended up being the lone survivor of a boat sinking at sea. He can lay claim to a unique title. He's the only person in the world to have survived on the seafloor for nearly three days. 
The Gulf of Guinea in the southeast Atlantic Ocean is rich with petroleum-laden layers of sedimentary seabed. Many offshore oil rig drilling operations dot the African coast here. On May 26, about 20 miles off of Escravos, Nigeria, in choppy seas, three tugboats pitched and yawed as they performed tension tow functions on a Chevron oil tanker filling up at single buoy mooring number 3. Just before 5 a.m., the tugboat Jascon 4 was caught by a large rogue wave and capsized. Because of ongoing piracy problems in the Gulf, security protocol on the tugboat was that the 12-man crew would lock themselves in their room when sleeping. Unfortunately, this rule slowed down the Jascon Force crew when they tried to escape. The crew members had to first scramble out of their cabins, that is, except for the vessel's cook, Harrison, who had gotten up to use the bathroom in his underwear. When the tugboat keeled over and the ocean rushed in, Harrison had to force the bathroom's metal door open against the wall of water. The pressure of the water was extremely strong and Harrison was unable to follow some of his colleagues to the emergency hatch. He watched in horror as a surge overwhelmed three crew members and swept them out of the boat into the raging sea. Then the water pushed Harrison down a narrow hallway into another bathroom which adjoined an officer's cabin. Dazed and bruised but miraculously still alive, Harrison held on to an overturned wash basin to keep his head above water in the four-foot square bathroom. The boat sank nearly 100 feet, eventually coming to rest upside down on the seabed. When the tugboat capsized, there was an immediate rescue operation launched with the other boats in the area and a helicopter. A diving crew quickly located the wreck and marked the location with buoys. They banged on the hull. Harrison hammered back, but they didn't hear him. As the divers weren't prepared for deep diving, they could only stay at the depth of the wreck for a limited period of time. The rescue was called off due to no evidence of survivors. After nearly a day of being in the bathroom, Harrison got up the courage to leave his little air pocket. In pitch darkness, he swam and felt his way into the engineer's office. Miraculously, there was another air pocket here, too, of about four feet high in Harrison's estimation. Having solved the immediate problem of having air to breathe, Harrison could focus on other concerns, the first one being that he was cold. In May, the surface temperature of the East Atlantic on average is a pleasant 81.9 degrees Fahrenheit, but Harrison was 100 feet down. Shivering, wet, and wearing only boxer shorts, Harrison faced hypothermia, or his body losing heat faster than he could produce it. Cautiously, Harrison felt his way around the cabin. He found some tools and used them to strip off wall paneling. With a mattress and the material from the wall, he was able to make a platform to sit on. This platform helped Harrison to stay afloat and lifted the upper half of his body out of the water, allowing him to reduce heat loss. Hungry, thirsty, cold, and stuck in complete darkness, Harrison was terrifying. He tried to think about his family. Quite religious, whenever he felt especially scared, Harrison would pray and call on Jesus to rescue him. Over time, the seawater began to remove the skin from Harrison's tongue. He could smell something rotting. He thought it was the decomposing bodies of his former shipmates. Every small sound in the dark was magnified. The creaking of the hull, the banging of the wreckage against the walls, and most horrifically, splashing and eating noises as fishes nibbled at corpses. Meanwhile, a dive support vessel, the Luek Toucan, arrived to the area of the sinking. The parent company of the Jascon 4, West African Ventures, had hired a deep sea salvage saturation diving team from subsea services company DCN Global to retrieve the bodies of the lost crew members. The six divers, deck crew, and technical staff of the Luek Toucan knew it was going to be a grueling mission. Aside from the heartrending work of recovering the dead, the boat had sunk upside down into soft mud, stirring up fine silt and creating extremely poor visibility. Ability. Furthermore, because of the security protocols, the boat was latched from the inside. Dive Team 2 consisted of Nico Van Heerden, Andre Erasmus, and Daryl Oosthuizen, with Supervisor Colby Ware at topside on the ship, helping to guide the divers via a connected microphone while watching the dive through a camera worn by Nico. The team spent over an hour breaking through an external watertight door and then a second metal door to get into the sunken boat. Once inside, it was extremely disorienting, with the ceiling being on the bottom and the floor over head. The murky water was filled with all sorts of hazards, including furniture and equipment. Slowly, painstakingly, the divers explored the boat. They'd recovered four corpses when Nico crawled up the stairs to the main deck. It was a tight squeeze with the diving gear on his back. He was in a small passageway getting his bearings when something suddenly reached out of the murk and touched him. Harrison had nearly given up hope when he had heard a noise that sounded like an anchor dropping. Then eventually he heard hammering on the hull of the boat. He knew it had to be divers. He banged on the wall but didn't think they heard him. Then Harrison saw the light from one of the divers' head torches as 
as he swam through the hallway past the far end of the cabin. Unfortunately, the diver was too quick and left the area before Harrison could reach him. But then came the magical moment. You may have seen the surreal, amazing rescue footage from Nico's video when he sees what he believes is another dead body. He touches the corpse's hand, and the hand unexpectedly squeezes his. Nico has a momentary freakout as his supervisor Colby shouts through the microphone, He's alive! He's alive! Colby then tells Nico to comfort Harrison by patting him on the shoulder and giving him a thumbs up sign. The divers were amazed to find Harrison alive. The maximum depth for recreational diving is 130 feet. Generally, recreational divers don't stay at 100 feet for more than 20 minutes. In terms of the air pocket, the divers had reached Harrison just in time. A human inhales roughly 350 cubic feet of air every 24 hours. However, because the boat was under pressure on the ocean floor, scientists estimate that Harrison's air pocket had been compressed by a factor of about 4. If the pressurized air pocket were about 216 cubic feet, it would contain enough oxygen to keep Harrison alive for about two and a half days. When Harrison was located, he had been underwater for about 60 hours. An additional danger came from the carbon monoxide or CO2 buildup. CO2 is fatal to humans at a concentration of about 5%. As Harrison breathed, he exhaled carbon dioxide, slowly increasing the levels of the gas in the tiny space. However, CO2 is absorbed by water, and by splashing the water inside his air pocket, Pocket, Harrison inadvertently increased the water's surface area, thereby heightening the absorption of CO2 and helping to keep the gas below the lethal 5% level. The divers describe Harrison as having CO2 poisoning, being short of breath and delirious when they found him. He wouldn't have lasted much longer. The divers first used hot water to warm Harrison up, then fitted him with an oxygen mask. Meanwhile, on the surface, the dive support crew was in contact with medical and diving experts, discussing how to best help the survivor. Harrison had a new problem, what divers commonly call the bends. The bends, also known as decompression sickness or caisson disease, occurs when nitrogen bubbles form in the blood as a result of changes in pressure. If Harrison ascended directly from 100 feet underwater to the surface of the ocean, the bubbles in his blood would cause in the best case, joint pain and rashes, to the worst case, paralysis, neurological issues, cardiac arrest, or possibly even death. It was decided that Harrison would be treated as if he were one of the saturation divers coming up after a dive. Harrison spent about 20 minutes getting used to breathing through the mask. Then the divers put a diving helmet and harness onto him. They were a little worried that he would panic as they got him out of the boat and would be a danger to the dive, but Harrison continued to be cool under pressure. The team was impressed with his level demeanor. Harrison was taken from the boat and led to a diving bell, which took him to the surface. He finally arrived topside at around 7 p.m. on Tuesday the 28th of May. Disoriented, Harrison thought that it was Sunday evening and that he had only been trapped for 12 hours. He was shocked to learn that he'd been underwater for over two days. From the diving bell, Harrison was moved to a decompression chamber, where he stayed for another two and a half days while his body decompressed to surface pressure. Of the 12 crew members on board the tugboat Jaskon 4, divers rescued one survivor and recovered 10 of the bodies. The search for the 11th crew member had to be called off due to dangerous conditions. Harrison made a full recovery from his ordeal and returned to his hometown of Wari, Nigeria. He didn't go to the funerals of his colleagues because he feared their family's reactions. Nigerians can be very religious, but are also superstitious. Some rumors spread that Harrison saved himself through black magic. Harrison was also plagued with survivor's guilt, wondering why he was the only one to live. Since the incident, Harrison's experienced PTSD. His wife, Akpavono Kene, says he suffers nightmares. Harrison will suddenly awake, screaming and flailing, convinced that he's underwater. Harrison has since taken a cooking job on dry land and vows to never again take a position on a boat. He made a pact with God when he was at the bottom of the ocean. When I was under the water, I told God, if you rescue me, I will never go back to the sea again. Never. Welcome back to our macabre series of shows featuring some of the worst things people have done to each other in the name of punishment. While in other shows we've talked about instruments of torture and killing that could be said to be basic. Claws that rip flesh, cudgels that smash bones. This particular instrument of horrifyingly inhumane torture could be said to have been cooked up by creative folks. As with just about anything we've talked about in this series, it would be unimaginable to suffer this treatment, but hey, we aren't going to say it's any worse than having your intestines chewed on by starving rats. Like that punishment though, this one was slow, making hanging or head chopping seem very merciful in comparison. This form of execution was created by the ancient Greeks. It had a few names and it might also be called the Bronze Bull or the Sicilian Bull, but how do we know anything about it at all? 
One of the answers is because it was written about in something called the Biblioteca Historica, which translates as historical library. It consists of many books written by an ancient Greek historian named Diodorus Siculus. In these books you'll find his version of the history of the world. From what went down in ancient Egypt to the leader Alexander the Great, quite a lot of it is still intact, but some parts in the series are missing or in fragments. In one of these books, Mr. Siculus wrote about the brazen bull, and this is what he said. The guy who invented it was an inventor by trade, and he was named Perilos of Athens. It's said before he built this thing somewhere between 570 and 554 BC, he actually pitched the idea. He was what you might call a creative technologist of the past, looking for some funding. He got that funding from a man named Phalaris, the tyrant of Akragas. Given his frightening title, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that this man was said to be very cruel. In some accounts of his life, it's written that he enjoyed torture and even went so low as to eat children. We should say that Encyclopedia Britannica cites research that says he wasn't as cruel as some people have written. Whatever the case, it seems he commissioned the building of the brazen bull. So how did one perish in a brazen bull? Well, it was certainly a thing conjured up by a creative yet sadistic imagination. It was said to be the same size of a bull but shaped from bronze, with an opening where a man could enter the thing. A fire was then lit under the bull and the man would slowly roast to death. But get this, it was made so that when the man was howling in agony his shrieks would emanate through specially distorted pipes built into the bull, so the impression an onlooker would get was an animal bellowing in pain. This might have been the fun part for someone like the tyrant of Akragas. The smoke would come out through the holes in the bull's nose, and that nose was filled with incense since burning bodies don't smell so good. The bones that were left would then be turned into bracelets, so the story goes. When the idea was pitched by Perilos, it said he said this to the tyrant Phalaris. The occupant will shriek and roar in unremitting agony, and his cries will come to you through the pipes as the tenderest, most pathetic, most melodious of bellowings. Your victim will be punished, and you will enjoy the music. When the bowl was finished, Phalaris told the inventor to get inside the thing to test out the sound, but some sources say he lit the fire and the inventor died there. Others say he pulled him out, but then killed him by pushing him over a cliff. It seems for all his hard work, Perilos was killed, but perhaps not because Phalaris didn't want to pay. Even though Phalaris is said to have been keen on cruelty, it's written that he said this to Perilos after hearing about the execution method. His words revolted me. I loathed the thought of such ingenious cruelty and resolved to punish the artificer in kind. I said to him, if your art can really produce this effect, get inside yourself and pretend to roar, and we'll see whether the pipes will make such music as you describe. By the way, it's written that upon his downfall, Phalaris was also killed inside the bull. So that's inventor and commissioner both killed at their own hands in a way. Word of the brazen bull was passed down and histories were written, and they linked the device with these two men, the inventor and the tyrant. But the history of the bull doesn't stop there. The Romans, it said, had a taste for the brazen bull, and if you've watched our other shows on Roman torture, you won't be surprised to hear that some people wouldn't have had many scruples about roasting a man to death and enjoying his screams. We might look at the story of a man named Saint Eustace. It said he became a martyr after being killed in the second century. The Romans were punishing many Christians before they themselves converted to Christianity under the Emperor Constantine, but that was in the 4th century AD, before a lot of Christian blood was spilled, and it seems a few Christians also got cooked to death inside a bronze animal. Saint Eustace was said to have been one of them. Before he converted to Christianity, he had served under a Roman emperor, but he saw the light, so to speak, when he had a vision one day, which involved a stag and a crucifix. Christians might tell you that this man then lost everything, which was one of those tests of God. He lost his cash, his servants, and his wife and kids were taken away from him by, of all things, a lion and a wolf. Yet his faith remained strong throughout. There are a few different stories as to what happened to this man, but some people will tell you he got his wealth back as well as his family, but in the end he, his wife and children were all roasted to death in the brazen bull on the orders of Emperor Hadrian. We looked at some Christian sources and they seem to back that up, although they don't say his family got the treatment too. We also found this piece of Christian history written in the 1800s. It seems to suggest that when Eustace and his family got roasted they died, but some miracles did happen. This is from that text. The holy martyrs, by divine power, remained alive for three days, praising and blessing the great giver of life and death. At last, when their voices ceased, the bull was opened, and all four were found without life, but also without any injury to their bodies or garments. It's written that other Christians close to him at this time went the same way. For instance, a man known as Saint Atipas. This was written about him. 
They became enraged and dragged him to the Temple of Artemis, and there they threw him into a glowing red-hot copper or brazen metal bowl where they normally put their sacrifices to the idols to cast demons out of their own people. He loudly prayed God to receive his soul and strengthen the faith of the Christians, and begged God to forgive those who were inflicting on him his torment. He then departed as peacefully as if he fell asleep. We should say that there are a lot of people who don't believe these stories and relate them more to legend than truth. It's not for us to say what's true or not. But most serious historians will at least tell you that the stories from the bull's surprising beginnings in Greece to Christian martyrs not feeling any pain while being roasted are hard to verify. What is very much true is that stories of the brazen bull have been passed down throughout the ages, and those manuscripts can still be read today. By the way, while you might see a brazen bull in a museum in the world, it won't be the real thing, only a depiction of one. You hear the echo of a gunshot. People all around you begin to scream in panic. You run and dive for cover. As you breathe heavily trying to get your bearings, you look down. You've been hit. A pool of blood begins to soak through your shirt. How does getting shot feel? Let's find out. We've all seen someone get shot in the movies or television shows, but do these depictions have it right? According to the CDC, in 2017, around 40,000 people died from gun-related deaths in the United States alone. However, many people also survive being shot, and when they tell their story and what it feels like, there are several commonalities. That being said, everyone is different. Some people have really high tolerances for pain, while others not so much. The sensations felt from being shot are most certainly connected to the location of the bullet wound, the size of the bullet, and the person themselves. But let's look at different accounts and see what most have in common. Many gunshot survivors remember the initial penetration of the bullet. The strange thing is, they don't remember feeling any pain at first. This is surprising, since you think a searing hot chunk of metal ripping through your skin, muscle, and nerves would be excruciating. However, for the most part, survivors of gun wounds tend not to notice they've been shot until they see blood. One gunshot survivor remembers the impact of the bullet feeling like someone had thrown a small pebble at her. The bullet hit her in the side, and all she remembers was being in shock, but not feeling any initial pain. This may be surprising at first, but this is not uncommon with people who have been shot. Many people recount that within the first few moments of being hit by a bullet, they didn't feel anything at all. Once the brain realizes that the body's been injured and it could be life-threatening, it goes into survival mode. The brain dumps adrenaline into the bloodstream which causes the body to increase blood pressure and heart rate, expand air passages to the lungs, and maximize energy output. This allows the body to reach superhuman levels and maintain homeostasis even under intense circumstances. The body obviously can't keep this heightened energy level up forever, but it does allow the body to continue functioning even if it's been mortally wounded. The lack of pain is also connected to the size of the bullet. Larger bullets create larger holes and tend to inflict more pain. However, you'd think a smaller caliber should still cause severe pain, but the body able to do amazing things under life or death circumstances. A smaller bullet, such as a 9mm that doesn't break apart on entry, will cause a lot less pain than a large bullet that tears apart into shrapnel. Bullets that break apart within the body can rip through surrounding tissue and muscle around the initial entry point. This causes widespread damage and pain in the affected area. The more damage caused, the more pain signals will be sent to the brain, the more excruciating the injury will be. Once the initial shock starts to wear off, the body begins damage control. Many gunshot victims remember feeling a burning sensation. Sensation. This is pretty universal among survivors. Some people describe the burning sensation as feeling sort of like an intense bee sting. However, the initial burning does not decrease, just intensifies, so it feels like being stung by a bee with a never-ending stinger, like a needle, just continuously being pushed into your body. The burning sensation seems to start the same. When the bullet penetrates the skin, the person feels an impact, but the burn doesn't start immediately. In fact, many gunshot survivors remember feeling numb. As the bullet enters their body, they can feel pressure, but it doesn't hurt. Then, a numbness sweeps across their entire body, radiating from the point that the bullet entered from. As the numbness and shock begin to fade, it's replaced by the burning sensation. Other than feeling like a never-ending bee sting, some people have described the burning sensation as being incredibly hot, like someone was sticking an iron poker that had just come out of a fire into their body. Other gunshot survivors explain that the burning sensation feels like someone is jamming their finger into a raw blister. The burning has also been described as an incredibly intense sunburn that's concentrated on a single point of the body, or like someone is taking taking a bunch of needles and just sticking them into them, except it's as if each time the needle enters the body, it's just continuously being pushed further and further in, with no end to the sensation. The burning seems to begin at the point of entry, but then radiates outward. This may be a small piece of shrapnel ripping through the nerves, but one thing is clear. For most people who have been shot, the burning sensation is what is felt after the brain becomes aware that the bullet has entered the body. Again, every person's body is different and therefore will react in different ways to intense trauma like being shot. Soldiers that have been shot 
shot have recounted that they've had a very different experience from a bullet ripping through them. Most agree that when the bullet enters the body, there is an initial period of no pain at all, but that doesn't last long. Instead of a slow burning, the bullet wound goes from a slight pressure to excruciating pain. The reason that soldiers may experience a more intense pain is because they most likely have been shot by a higher caliber bullet from a rifle. The ammunition and guns used in military warfare are probably not the same weapons that civilians are shot by during senseless acts of gun violence. This is not always true, but it would seem that being shot by an assault rifle versus a pistol with a small caliber bullet would correlate to a more intense pain. One soldier who was shot says the initial shock wore off after a few seconds of a bullet entering his stomach. Then the pain immediately began. He remembers it feeling like being hit by a sledgehammer in the stomach over and over, resulting in the worst incontinence possible. However, with his intense pain, he saw that a warm numbness flowed through the rest of his body and eventually he blacked out. On the other end of the spectrum, some people who have been shot say there was no pain at all. They didn't feel a burning sensation. They didn't feel like they'd been ripped open. They felt nothing. This could just be based on the person, but there are actually a few accounts of people being shot and saying they didn't feel much pain. One man who was shot in the calf by a 22 caliber bullet said it didn't hurt. He chalks this up to the bullet being small. It also probably had to do with where he got shot, as there are no vital organs in the calf. Being shot in different areas of the body seemed to account for different sensations. But what about being shot in the head? You may be surprised to find that surviving a gunshot wound to the head is not as uncommon as you might think. You might also expect that being shot in the head would be excruciating, but this isn't necessarily the case either. One man was accidentally shot in the head by his wife while he slept. Now, accidentally shooting someone in the head seems unlikely, but that is the story the wife stuck to. Either way, while her husband slept, the gun went off and the bullet ripped through his skull. When the man awoke, he didn't even know he'd been shot. Instead, he complained to his wife of a massive headache. The headache was so bad, the man asked his wife to drive him to the hospital, which she did. According to the victim, it wasn't until the nurse at the hospital informed him that he had been shot in the head that he realized what had happened. At this point, the wife ran out of the hospital to avoid being charged with attempted murder. However, this is not the only account of someone being shot in the head and surviving. There are a few commonalities between survivors of gunshot wounds to the head. The first is the intense headache that accompanies the bullet penetrating the skull. This is not surprising, as they now have a piece of metal lodged in their brain. The other commonality is a ringing sound. Most people who have been shot in the head and survive say they hear a constant ringing in their ears. Some describe the ringing as a unique sound unlike anything they'd ever heard before. It's so intense and loud it drowns out almost all other noise. Other survivors describe it as a really loud buzzing, like having bees inside your ears. And yet others describe it like the ringing of a bell in your head. Regardless of the description of the ringing, everyone agrees that it is incredibly loud and persistent. There also seems to be an initial ping sound from being shot in the head. The ping then starts to intensify into the ringing, which lasts anywhere from hours to days or weeks later. The ringing isn't painful per se, it's just really loud and annoying. Most gunshot survivors say the most painful part of being shot is the recovery process. The initial gunshot wound for many seems to be a burning sensation, but that's nothing compared to what happens if they survive the gunshot. They're rushed to surgery and depending on where the bullet entered, the operation to remove the bullet and mend the wound is excruciating. Many gunshot survivors say that the recovery and rehab process after being shot is much worse than the getting shot itself. One survivor even described how when she was operated on, the doctors couldn't find the bullet initially and they didn't want to go digging around in her body looking for it so they decided to leave the bullet in. The survivor had to have multiple surgeries in order to recover from the gunshot and during one of them the bullet had actually been pushed close to the surface of the skin. She remembered the bullet was practically poking out of her body until she convinced one of the surgeons to remove it. Many gunshot wounds take months to heal. This means that for a long period of time survivors are in constant pain from their body healing. And yet the pain of recovery isn't even the worst part for many gunshot survivors. It's the psychological trauma that haunts them for the rest of their lives that causes the most pain. Most people who are shot end up with PTSD. They're typically sent to counselors and therapists to help them work through the traumatic experience. But this does not always help. Being shot does not mean they're afraid of being around guns or loud noises, but even things that are unrelated to being shot might set off a sense of fear and terror. For many, with the help of medical professionals and counselors, the PTSD can go away, but for some it doesn't, and they have to live the rest of their lives with the disorder. Getting shot is never pleasant. Whether it's a burning sensation, intense pain, or psychological trauma, it is something that stays with you for the rest of your life. The sensations associated with being shot depend on the person, the type of bullet, and where the bullet entered. Many people who survive being shot never fully recover. Most of you people watching this will have experienced the topic of today's show. If you haven't yet, then statistically it's very likely you will. In fact, many males of a certain age will get down with this biological buzz on a daily basis. While females might not be as prolific in producing this heavenly stimulant that nature has bestowed upon us. We might be indebted to this fleshy machine that we call our body for giving us a natural high that for the most part doesn't cost us a penny. It offers some respite from a grind of work and the endless obstacles and what can sometimes be 
be a difficult life. For that reason, we salute the orgasm, this wonderful gift Mother Nature has bequeathed to us. Let's now discuss the nitty gritty of our gift in this episode of the Infographic Show, Female Orgasm versus Male. Before we start comparing orgasms, let's take a look at why we have them in the first place. Of course, we know that we have orgasms as part of the impetus to copulate with another person, this gift that makes the experience pleasurable, and in turn, we sometimes churn out other human beings and keep the species ticking over. Do all animals have orgasms though? That's something that scientists are not absolutely sure about, because we can't exactly ask a dog, a fish, or a proboscis monkey what it was like for them after they got it on. Scientists know by observing some animals' vocal cords and muscle contractions that they do seem to have this biological carnal payoff just as humans do. All female mammals have clitorises, and scientists have even stimulated non-human female primates in labs and given them orgasms. Perhaps that's the best job a monkey can get when sent to the lab for testing. They didn't say how they did the testing testing, however. So simply put, science thinks that most animals have sex because of the feeling they receive from it. Being the beneficiary of an orgasm is of course not the only reason animals do it. There may be power plays if there is a hierarchy, for instance, but it certainly acts as the main incentive. We don't know what it feels like for the animal, of course, but as one scientist talking to popular science says, it looks like a very pleasurable experience for some animals. Talking about our male feathered friends, he said the bird shudders its wings and clenches its feet as it ejaculates. Who knows whether it feels like a human orgasm, but the external behavior looks like it. We're told animals don't have the brain capacity to plan for babies. Rats don't think when they're getting it on that they can't wait to see a little rascal ratty taking its first breaths in the world. They do it for pleasure. Humans are different because we are cognizant of the consequences of lovemaking if conditions haven't been met to prevent pregnancy. But some animals also masturbate as humans do. They may not fantasize as we do or spend time and energy watching others do it for their own gratification and enhanced stimulation, but some do enjoy pleasuring themselves. These animals include other primates, the animal champs of sexual self-gratification, elephants, walruses, bats, and turtles, among many others. Some animals, such as the brown bear and wolf, even practice autofellatio. Humans generally don't have the flexibility for that. We orgasm fans know that when it happens, it is pleasurable. Our muscles contract, we feel euphoria, and then we experience a period of relaxation. We also know that orgasms are not all made equal with some feeling like a minor bump of pleasure chemicals in our brain, while others feel more like being maligned into the ecstasies of chemical heaven. We experience what is called a neuromuscular euphoria when our brain's pleasure centers are activated. This happens because of stimulation, but that stimulation can come in many ways. We'll cut this short because all the ways one can orgasm would take a while to explain. As you probably know, even stimulation of a nipple or other erogenous zone can create this sublime feeling. Some people even orgasm in their dreams, when thought alone is the main driver. There's even something called foot orgasm syndrome, which you can work out for yourself. It's unusual to say the least and apparently not pleasant. But for men, they mostly orgasm when their penis or scrotum is stimulated, and something called the pudendal nerve sends signals to the brain. It's the same for women when their clitoris is stimulated. Both sexes can orgasm from stimulation of their rectum when the pelvic nerve is stimulated. The hypogastric nerve sends signals from a man's prostate, while it does the same in a woman's uterus and cervix. For women, the vagus nerve comes into play when the cervix, uterus, and vagina is stimulated. These are what we might call the main bases. When orgasm is achieved, your brain is flooded with neurochemicals, and these activate what we call the brain's reward systems. It's these reward systems that motivate us to do certain things, not just have sex, but perhaps complete a marathon or get a job done. Sexual arousal affects many areas of the brain, such as the amygdala, cerebellum, pituitary gland, nucleus accumbens, and ventral tegmental area. If all that terminology means little to you, the Journal of Neuroscience simply tells us that sexual arousal in terms of brain patterns looks similar to what happens in the brain when one takes heroin. Thankfully, sexual stimulation isn't as expensive and doesn't produce severe withdrawal symptoms after long-term use. Wouldn't that make a dent in our masturbating regimen? For men, the result of this orgasm is usually the release of fluid through the penis. That may contain semen. Dry outcomes are possible too. All sorts of things come into play here, but usually with enough testosterone on the male can send his homemade gunge into a female orifice or simply into open space. Prior to this, the man is aroused and his penis becomes erect due to blood racing up the appendage's arteries at high speeds. The blood rush causes hardness, and the rest of the body tenses. Houston, 
Get ready for liftoff. This may take a while, but orgasm can be achieved in as quickly as 30 seconds from the first arousal. At this time, the heart might be beating around 150 to 175 beats per minute, while parts of the body might be moving involuntarily. Nature now plays an ace card by secreting a pre-ejaculatory fluid in the penis, which helps protect the arriving sperm by changing the pH balance in the urethra. All you men know is that when it's time for liftoff, there's no going back, and this is called ejaculatory inevitability, a fine term if we ever heard one. Muscles around the penis and anus will contract rapidly and you may push out your pelvis, and all those chemicals flood the brain and possibly cause one to grimace wildly like a madman in the grips of an ecstatic seizure. But it's not over yet. Men go through a pleasant recovery stage, a kind of easy come down plateau after the rush, and they will see their member slowly reduce to its original, unimpressive state. Younger guys can sometimes recover from this in as little as 15 minutes, while older men may require hours to go through it all again. There seems to be a lot of content out there on what it feels like to have a female orgasm, and not much on the feeling of the male orgasm. As we said, orgasms are not all the same. Perhaps a seasoned masturbator on his fifth adult video session of the day might have a few substandard climaxes in that day's orgasm medley. But when one is orgasmed for the first time with the love of his life, the feeling might be somewhat more intense. One description we found online said this of his orgasms, like a tickle that creeps up from every corner of your body until you're desperate for it to stop. And and also to continue forever, as if squeegees are scraping through your limbs, like a gunshot, startling and discreet, leaving you with the vibrations, the trembling steel, the blowback. Hmm. That sounds good. And the reason many men during sex or masturbation will be thinking about the next round before the current is even finished, but they often change their mind immediately after orgasm. That's just because they've achieved a satisfactory result and the brain is contented, at least for a while. Again, we have this feeling, so we'll want to do it again and again. Men are blessed with this. Some may argue that they were cursed, so that the merry-go-round of life continues to spin. It's as simple as that. With that in mind, let's turn to women. Women could still procreate even if they didn't have an orgasm. Women don't need to achieve orgasm to have babies, so why are they blessed with this blissful treatment from nature? There's been much research about this. First, we should say that 10% of women don't orgasm through sexual intercourse, or not at all, even with their own hands or certain purpose-made instruments. Some sources say it may be as high as 15%. You can read things like this on the web. I don't understand. I feel like less of a woman because I can't have an orgasm, and I want to so bad. I feel incomplete sometimes after sex. Vice magazine cited what it called the biggest ever orgasm study, which told us that nearly 37% of American women required clitoral stimulation to experience orgasm, while 18% said that vaginal stimulation did the trick. 9% of women in that study said that nothing worked, not clitoris rubbing, cunnilingus, pulsating plastic toys, or penetrative sex. 66.6% .6 of these women did say they enjoyed their clitoris being stimulated, usually with an up and down rubbing motion with medium pressure of perhaps their own or their partner's digit. As for why women orgasm at all, science is not agreed on this. Some experts tell us that the reason is because orgasm will help a woman find a man of better genetic quality. Women may not orgasm with a man of lower genetic quality, and so we're told the fact that they can orgasm will weed out the weaker men. Not everyone agrees with this theory though. Some scientists compare the female orgasm to the male nipple in that it serves little evolutionary function. Another theory is that orgasms in women will make them want to have sex with as many men as possible, and this increases the possibility of getting pregnant and promote what you could call sperm competition. Others suggest that her orgasm will help bond a pair and so ensure that the child has two parents. Orgasming in unison is quite a beautiful thing, perhaps sometimes even spiritual, and maybe that bonds a couple. This doesn't say much about many animals though that are hardly monogamous. It's an ongoing debate. Now, let's look at the female orgasm in terms of what happens physiologically. Like men, women's orgasms can be vastly different. Sometimes they may feel like they've been rocketed to the moon and back, and sometimes they're a mere fulfilling glitch in an otherwise unspectacular day. Like a man, the woman will experience a rush of happy chemicals to the brain. She may also contract and convulse and exhibit facial expressions that can border on being frightening. Again, we can't talk for all women in all orgasms. We can see what some women say about their orgasms, though. 
One woman told Cosmopolitan, The pleasure builds up and I feel it coming. Then an explosion of pleasure takes over everything from the waist down. The feeling trickles down through my legs and everything is completely relaxed. As you can see, this doesn't sound too different from what men say. It can also sound like more hard work though, as this woman explains. It's like a warm, tingling wave that starts at your center and just radiates outward. It can be frustratingly blissful as you start to build and then lose it, and then build again and each time you start to climb that mountain, it becomes more intense and desperate. Perhaps we could say a man is a rocket with a certain trajectory, and a woman is more a complex machine with a few more moves before it achieves liftoff. The experts tell us that is correct, in that the female orgasm is more complex. She may have multiple orgasms or even what are called blended orgasms. If you've ever been the sole contributor of such an orgasm, you'll know it can last longer than the male orgasm and come with many shakes, involuntary convulsions, and perhaps the man being gripped onto tightly as she experiences her bit of physical bliss. Women can also have relaxation orgasms and tension orgasms, which should be self-explanatory. As you know, this orgasm might be clitoral, vaginal, or from G-spot stimulation, or even other happy zones such as lips or nipples. They can be grand, they can be minor, and they can move mountains or barely eclipse normality. Unlike men, women can have a remarkable variety of orgasmic experiences, which evolve throughout the lifespan, said one academic. A woman's erotic body map is not etched in stone, but rather is an ongoing process of experience discovery and construction. Now men sound rather dull and predictable. We are also told that women become more lost in the moment during orgasm and the build up to it, that they block out everything else. Does that mean like some men they could be thinking about an upcoming football game or how they're performing during copulation? Yes, that could happen too, if she's not into it. But as one writer said, if she is, we lose our usual self-awareness and consciousness of other noises, feelings, and smells around us. Described like this, it sounds what we might call more full on, as if the woman is not the astronaut taking off but the rocket itself. It sounds like it could be almost an out of body experience that lasts longer too, about 20 seconds compared to that short blast that the men get. But in terms of what happens to our brains, we are not that different. Women might have different kinds of orgasms and essentially things might seem different, but that heroin hit we get is both present in men and women. We may be different in how quickly we get aroused, usually easier for men, but as psychology today tells us, the orgasm orgasmic experience is almost identical in both sexes. This means heart rate, blood pressure, tensed muscles, and the release of the love chemical oxytocin. Nature didn't get too complicated in this respect, and made us both similar. We feel the same love buzz of an orgasm, and for this we can be thankful, as we can empathize and know what joy we can give to each other. We are different in some respects, though, in that men self-administer orgasms more often. In spite of some remaining social taboos preventing some women from pleasuring themselves as often as they might. The Kinsey Institute tells us that men are just hardwired to beat off. Call it practice for the big day that an orgasm might result in the beating heart of another wonderfully constructed human being. O233 hours local, and in a mountain complex in North Korea just over a hundred miles from the Chinese border, technicians scramble to remove camouflage netting from the entrance to a deep underground bunker. That bunker has been cut into the mountainside and covered over with camouflage to fool American spy satellites loitering hundreds of miles overhead. The cover of night helps to obfuscate the rush of activity, and the heavy cloud cover is exactly what the Hermit Kingdom was waiting for. Out of the converted mineshaft, a huge truck is carefully backed out. The massive vehicle has only one purpose, to transport the equally massive Hwasong-50 intercontinental ballistic missile. Finally eased out of its hiding hole, the truck begins the laborious process of lifting the giant missile into position. Over 40 feet tall, the missile is taller than a two-floor home and has the power to destroy several square miles of a densely packed city. The launch command officer picks up a phone hardwired straight to an underground telephone line that's connected directly to Kim Jong-un. The North Koreans have to resort to primitive telephone technology to ensure the United States or its allies aren't listening in somehow. On the other end, the North Korean dictator gives a single word. The Hwasong-15 intercontinental ballistic missile fires its main engine, shaking the entire launch complex to its core. Launch personnel hide behind blast screens or huddle inside the relative safety of the launch truck's armored cab, hunkering down in case something goes wrong and the missile and its entire fuel load explodes. Two seconds later, the missile proves to be in good operation and lifts off the ground. A thousand miles above the Earth, the United States' space-based infrared system immediately detects the thermal plume of the massive rocket. A low-Earth satellite sends an immediate flash alert to the second space warning squadron at Buckley Air Force Base in Colorado. Brother and sister units across the broad web of U.S. missile defense and the commanders of every U.S. geographical command. 
A second U.S. satellite in a geostationary orbit confirms the thermal signature of a large ballistic missile and chirps a second emergency alert. The massive Hwasong-15 is nearing supersonic flight and has punched several hundred feet through the clouds and into the open sky. The U.S.'s space-based infrared system satellites have now focused their full attention on the telltale thermal signature of the big rocket. Cloud cover may have made it impossible to see liftoff with the naked eye, but the incredible heat given off by the fiery liftoff was easy to spot by infrared sensors. Now the large rocket is screaming through the air, riding a thermal plume several hundred feet long and thousands of degrees hot. The U.S. satellites immediately begin to compare the thermal signature of the North Korean rocket with a large onboard library of known missile launches. In less than a second, there's a match with two different Hwasong-15 test launches from the late 2010s. The confirmed match is immediately sent to U.S. Space Command. U.S. Space Force personnel are stunned by the multiple threat warnings from the space-based network and rush to pour through the data. Humans are far slower than machines, though, and it'll take time to verify the threat. The North Korean missile is now twice as high as a commercial airliner, and its main rocket engine is still going strong. Space Force personnel have confirmed the launch as authentic. An emergency flash is dispatched to U.S. forces in South Korea and across the Pacific. It's impossible to know where the missile is headed this early in flight. Via hotline to the DoD and the White House, the alert is out. North Korea has fired a ballistic missile, possibly tipped with a nuclear warhead. The main engine on the Hwasong-15 shuts down as it runs out of fuel. The missile coasts for a brief second, traveling at several thousand miles an hour now in the upper atmosphere, before a series of explosive bolts just under three-quarters of the way up separate the first stage of the rocket from the second stage. A second later, the second stage engine fires, and the vehicle lurches forward as it prepares to exit the Earth's atmosphere. An aide rushes to interrupt a meeting between the President of the United States of America and the leader of a partner nation. There's no time for formalities, and the President is practically dragged out of the room so he can be informed. North Korea has launched a nuclear attack. Target is still unknown. The President immediately heads for the highly restricted and secretive situation room in the heart of the White House. From there, he'll be able to communicate with American forces around the world and defend real-time tracking data from various American assets. U.S. Space Command issues an order for radar installations in South Korea and Japan to begin tracking the North Korean launch. Sea-based SPY-1 radars on American naval vessels are networked into the massive surveillance effort tracking the North Korean missile. While boosting into space, the missile is at its most vulnerable, but the United States still lacks its capability to rapidly destroy a missile during this initial phase. With development on high-velocity projectiles and directed energy weapons, it's hoped that in the near future U.S. forces will be able to down a missile during this vulnerable phase. For now, though, all U.S. assets can do is watch and gather data which will help determine where the missile is headed and which missile defense assets to activate. With a nuclear threat confirmed, the United States Secret Service begins preparations to move the president to a secure and highly classified location. If the missile is aimed at the White House, the president has less than 40 minutes to vacate. U.S. terminal high-altitude defense batteries in South Korea, Guam, and Hawaii are activated. Their powerful AN-TPY-2 radars begin sweeping the sky for signs of the threatening missile. Designed to obliterate an incoming ballistic missile during its terminal phase, the batteries of the interceptors are currently useless and can only defend the areas they're assigned to. Patriot missile defense batteries in the U.S. bases across the Pacific go on alert. These two are short-range defenses which are only useful for defending specific locations. U.S. Aegis-equipped warships in the region are given the same alert. Their SM-3 missiles can also be used for short-range ballistic missile intercepts just outside the atmosphere, but require the target to be in its descent stage. With a range of several hundred miles, though, each Aegis-equipped ship can help protect multiple U.S. installations or naval battle groups. The U.S. Northern Command at Peterson Air Force Base begins preparations to activate the United States' homeland defenses. At Fort Greeley, Alaska and Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, the ground-based mid-course defense system is activated, a collection of 44 interceptors. These missiles have a far greater range than either the mobile THAAD or the Navy's SM-3 missiles and are designed to intercept a target in the mid-course before it's had a chance to enter terminal phase and is still cruising through space. More data is needed, however, and all that U.S. forces can currently do is watch and wait. It now has become clear from the missile's trajectory that this is not an attack against forces in South Korea or Guam. Japan is also ruled out as a target. Hawaii remains a likely target, but so does the rest of the U.S. mainland. The U.S. president is notified that based on the missile's trajectory and speed, it is not a test of a new missile. All the data points to this being a legitimate launch against American forces. Given North Korean capabilities, it's likely this is an attack against either Hawaii or the American West Coast. While North Korea has missiles capable of reaching the East Coast, it's not believed they have the targeting capabilities to strike that far with any sort of precision. 
The President authorizes the use of ground-based interceptors against the incoming threat and order the U.S. Navy ships near Hawaii or the American West Coast to move into positions to best protect major population centers. Across the United States, a fleet of specially modified aircraft put into the air. These big planes are loaded with communications gear and hardened against electromagnetic pulses. They're known as doomsday airplanes because it's their job to ensure that the President of the United States can remain in contact with all U.S. military forces even in the event of a massive nuclear strike against the homeland. The planes will fly high enough to avoid being caught up in destruction below and provide a direct airborne link between each other and surviving space and ground stations across the world. They will not come back down until the crisis is over, with a special fleet of aerial tankers dedicated to keeping them fueled and flying. For the moment, they settle into an orbital pattern across the West Coast, the East Coast, and the American heartland. The full might of the U.S. nuclear triad is officially on alert and prepared to retaliate against any potential threat, with the possibility of another nation using the cover of a North Korean strike to attack the U.S. with its own weapons, America from this point on has to be prepared to fight a nuclear war against any adversary. Troop recall orders are issued for American units across the world, informing soldiers they must drop whatever they're doing and immediately report for duty. Nuclear-capable aircraft are prepared for a possible nuclear mission, and nuclear munitions are prepared for possible loading and launch. Deep in the darkest recesses of the world's oceans, the American nuclear ballistic missile submarine fleet makes its own preparations to rain down apocalypse on the President's command. The second stage of the Hwasong-15 missile runs out of fuel. The payload detaches from the second stage and using a chemical-powered thruster adjusts its course and heading. The missile is now flying unpowered, riding the incredible momentum built by the massive two-stage rocket and moving as much as 4.2 miles a second. U.S. Space Command issues new tracking data on the North Korean missile and confirms separation of the payload from the second stage. Based on this new data, Hawaii is ruled out as a target. Current speed and elevation dictate that a hit on the southern American west coast is likely. Armed with this new data, U.S. missile defense personnel opt for a GBI launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base instead of Fort Greeley in Alaska. Four of the long, skinny missiles are activated and fed live targeting data, but they can't be launched yet. They must wait until the enemy missile draws closer before launching. The American president is rushed out of the Situation Room and two Marine One, his personal helicopter. Two attachés join the president. One carries the nuclear football, the remote nuclear command authority unit which gives the president the power to order Armageddon from anywhere in the world. The second carries a large backpack-like communications device that serves to keep the president in contact with all branches of the government and the military at all times. Rather than head to a predetermined shelter, the president opts to instead board Air Force One, believing that there's little risk to a full-blown nuclear attack on the homeland. From Air Force One, he'll be safe from the ground effects of a nuclear blast and be able to remain in contact with the rest of the military and government. U.S. and South Korean special forces stationed in South Korea and Japan are mustered and rushed to armories in preparation for a strike into the North. These elite units have been kept at high readiness due to recent hostilities from the North. Their specially modified Black Hawk helicopters can evade enemy radar and even fly more silently than any other helicopters in the world. They have one mission infiltrate known North Korean nuclear sites and neutralize them from within. U.S. and South Korean alert aircraft take to the skies in anticipation of a full-blown offensive from the north. On the ground, forces across the DMZ prepare for combat, and an alarm is sounded in Seoul. In case of hostilities, it's expected that North Korea will shell Seoul directly from behind the DMZ and has so many guns that it can deliver a whopping 10,000 rounds of high explosives per minute to the city of 10 million. American supercomputers calculate the trajectory, altitude, and speed of the North Korean warhead and feed that data to the ground-based mid-course defense system. With careful math, the computers calculate a firing solution, and green light is given for the launch of interceptors. Four GBIs lift off from their silos in the California desert. The missiles will fly not to where the North Korean nuke is, but rather where it will be when they intercept it with a dumb kinetic warhead that will destroy the enemy nuke through sheer kinetic energy. As they lift into the sky, TPY-2 and sea-based radars are networked together and feed them a steady diet of tracking data. In Guam, Japan, and South Korea, air crews rush to their aircraft in anticipation of full-blown war with North Korea. First up will be F-15s and F-16s to establish air dominance. Normally, stealthy B-2 bombers would slip in behind the air superiority fighters to take out critical air defenses and communications nodes, but the bulk of the B-2 fleet is in Missouri and unprepared for combat. Instead, the Air Force's big stick, the B-52, is prepared for immediate action. These aircraft will require at least an hour to prep, but taking off from bases across the South Pacific will be able to put steel on target within the day. U.S. interceptors are now in space and speeding toward the calculated intercept point with the North Korean warhead. 
The interceptors have ditched their ascent stages and make only small corrections using chemical thrusters. If the calculated firing solution is bad, they could miss the North Korean warhead by miles. In that case, it'll be up to the Navy's Aegis vessels to down the warhead before it can strike an American city. Updated tracking data reveals the target is likely Los Angeles. The first wave of U.S. Special Operations Forces are given the green light from the American president to take off in their modified Black Hawk helicopters. Their destination is several North Korean nuclear launch facilities believed to be capable of rapid deployment. Other ground attack aircraft based in South Korea are already on their way to their targets, intent on destroying any ability for North Korea to launch a second attack. The U.S. president boards Air Force One. Upon arrival, he asks the United States Congress for a formal declaration of war with North Korea. The North Korean warhead suddenly breaks up into multiple smaller fragments as it ejects a cloud of highly reflective chaff. The metallic confetti is meant to confuse radar systems and make it harder to target the warhead. The warhead is now in eight pieces. Each piece could be a separate warhead or could be a decoy meant to lure missile defense systems away from the real warhead. U.S. ground and space-based radar struggle to pick out the real warhead from possible decoys from within the threat cloud. TPY-2 and sea-based X-band radars are best suited for this task, and it falls on them now to give a good intercept course for America's GBIs. Powerful processors churn through all the available data to sniff out the real threat from amongst the chaff and decoys. If they fail, millions of people will die. Using extremely precise measurements, the dummy warheads are singled out. Because of North Korea's inexperience with MIRV warheads and the use of decoys, the dummy warheads don't quite match the profile of a real warhead as perfectly as it flies through space. With a good intercept solution, the GBIs detach their exo-atmospheric kill vehicle. It will take six minutes for them to reach their target. There's nothing anyone can do now but pray. Unbeknownst to the United States, China has launched its own rapid response forces into North Korea. Elite Chinese troops penetrate North Korean airspace in fast transport helicopters. Their goal is the same as the Americans – seize Kim Jong-un's nuclear arsenal before it can be used again, and thus incur the wrath of the American nuclear triad. With both American and Chinese troops headed to the same objectives, though, this attack now has the possibility of sparking all-out war between the U.S. and China. American EKVs scream through space at over 4,000 miles per hour. They're just seconds from a successful intercept or a catastrophic failure. The first EKV screams past the intercept point, missing the North Korean weapon by a dozen miles. The second EKV hits nothing. It too misses the North Korean warhead by over three miles. A second after the second EKV, the third strikes its target true, moving at a combined speed of just under 10,000 miles an hour. The impact produces a bright flash in the sky for a brief second. Nuclear detonation requires a precise chain of events, so the impact of the interceptor does not set off the nuclear explosion. Multiple ground stations and ship-based radar assets all confirm the good news. Two misses followed by a direct hit. The threat has been neutralized and the dummy warheads will burn up in the atmosphere. The American president receives the good news aboard Air Force One. He can still see Washington, D.C. out the left side of the aircraft. And despite this threat being over, he will not order a return to the White House. The conflict has just begun and more nuclear attacks are possible at any minute from North Korea. On the ground half a world away, the South Korean and U.S. armies are preparing for what will be the costliest war since World War II, a conflict that will make the original Korean War look like a cap-gun shootout. American warplanes are already en route to the Hermit Kingdom, preparing to drop tens of thousands of pounds of high explosives on suspected nuclear sites, and special forces from both the U.S. and China are racing each other to seize Kim Jong-un's nuclear arsenal. On the border, the North Korean army is finally making its opening gambit, and over a thousand pieces of artillery begin to rain hell down on the South's defenders. As we write this, you don't have to look far to find headlines in the media containing the words U.S. and Iran and conflict. The BBC writes that the USA has sent over 1,000 troops to the Middle East because, according to the American Acting Defense Secretary, Patrick Shanahan, Iran has been acting hostile. Iran has been accused of oil tanker attacks, and the country, it said, will also soon breach a 2015 deal regarding its uranium stockpiles. The New York Times has called this a new confrontation with the West. How bad could this get? What kind of a threat would Iran be? Is there really a threat at all when compared to the might of the U.S. military? Let's have a look. If you watched many of our other military comparison shows, then you're likely already an expert when it comes to the arsenal of the U.S. military. You'll know that the U.S. spends more on defense than any other country by a long, long way. 
Sources differ and it's hard to get the exact spending down to the last dollar, but in 2018 it's reported that the USA's defense budget was somewhere between $587 billion and $597 billion. But if you go to the actual US Department of Defense website, one of the first things you'll read is that President Trump plans to pump an extra $160 billion into defense. The prediction from the DoD right from the horse's mouth is that by the end of 2019, defense spending will have reached $686 billion. Where does all this cash go? Well, the DoD website just breaks it down into simply various departments. The Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and Joint Chiefs. If you're wondering what the Joint Chiefs are, well, they kind of run the show. Part of their mission statement reads, The future operating environment will place new demands on leaders at all levels. Our leaders must have the training, education, and experience to meet those demands. It's not all about spending money on killer toys, of course, because you have a lot of paychecks at the end of the week. The US military has 2,083,100 personnel. 1,281,900 work as active personnel and 801,200 reservists. On top of that, you have all kinds of special units and specialists to pay. It's not free when the US, say, wants to buy artificial intelligence technology to scan faces, go through hours of drone videos, etc. Research and development, according to the US military, eats up a great deal of money. Thankfully, someone else has broken down the budget for us, and it goes like this. A little over $205 billion goes to the Navy, and the Air Force will basically get the same at $204.8 billion. $191.4 billion will go to the Army, and $116.6 billion will go to projects spread across the DoD. $104.3 billion will go to research, development, test, and evaluation. $143.1 billion will go to buying new things, such as expensive aircraft and ships. $155.8 billion will actually go to the actual men and women of the military through the paycheck budget. $22.5 billion will go to building houses for personnel and other military construction projects. $292.7 billion, the biggest part of the budget, is for maintaining the military. If you add all this up though, it comes to more than the actual budget. That's because some of the spending overlaps, such as research, purchases, or wages, that might need to be accounted for as part of the individual forces' budgets. If you look at what the military has been buying or trying to buy, you'll see that the F-35 Joint Strike Fighters are a big item on the shopping list. These things also get sold, of course, but as we write this, Japan, according to some reports, is no longer looking at buying many more of them because it has created its own aircraft that it sees as superior. Nonetheless, if you follow military news, you'll know that these things are still selling like hotcakes. The US currently has around 200, plans to build a staggering 1,763 more. As we've said before, the US no doubt has the most powerful air force in the world, and we just cannot list everything that's in its arsenal of flying machines. But some of the most powerful beasts include the fleets of F-22 Raptors, F-15E Strike Eagles, F-A-18EF Super Hornets, and F-16 Fighting Falcons. Some of the newer machines are 15 KC-46 tanker strategic military transport aircrafts and also the B-21 Stealth Bomber. So, can Iran afford to spend billions and billions of dollars on just one plane alone? Well, the answer is a resounding no, and in fact, recent news reports tell us that the country has slashed defense spending to the equivalent of $43 billion. Compare this to reports in 2019 that the US Navy just paid Virginia shipbuilder Huntington Ingalls $15 billion to start construction on the new Ford-class aircraft carriers. Also bear in mind the billion spent on new aircraft, or the two fleet replenishment oilers at $1.1 billion. The 5,113 joint light tactical vehicles costing $2 billion, or the M1 Abrams tank modification setting the US back $2.7 billion. Just one new Columbia-class submarine will cost $3.7 billion, and the military has requested $6 billion for some DDG-51 Arleigh Burke-class destroyers. The list goes on and on, and we cannot possibly tell you everything on that shopping list. But all in all, you have over 2 million personnel, around 13,400 military planes and counting, including about 5,700 helicopters, add to that 6,287 tanks for land-based operations, then on water you have a total of 20 aircraft carriers which are like a traveling army and would be very important when fighting a country located on the other side of the globe, the USA also has 68 destroyers and 68 submarines, but as you know, more of both are in the pipeline. As you can see, this is shaping up to be a David and Goliath story. 
No one doubts that in terms of equipment, the USA has by far the biggest and arguably most advanced military in the world. We say arguably because countries such as China, Japan, the UK, India, France, Russia also have some very capable military toys. Iran though, well, you won't find the country on the top 10 lists when it comes to military might, and some writers have described Iran's equipment as being Cold War era machines. In total, Iran has 523,000 active military personnel, but also around 350,000 reservists. They own 509 military aircraft, which sounds fairly impressive, but let's see what kind of planes these are. For starters, they have 54 American-made McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom IIs. Some of these are pretty old, but we're told many have been upgraded. Joining the list are also some other capable multi-role aircraft, such as 23 French-made Dassault Mirage F-1s. As for ground attack, Iran has about 50 Russian-made planes and the Sukhoi Su range, the Su-22, Su-24, and 25. Iran is also in the process of building a fifth-generation stealth fighter aircraft called the IAIO Kher 313. Although some experts have cast doubts as to how viable this aircraft will be, this is not a weak air force by any means, but much of that strength comes from purchased American military hardware. That said, much of this fleet is aging and in need of an upgrade whereas the American military has never stopped upgrading their equipment, whether they need it or not, as any American taxpayer can tell you. As for tanks, Iran has 1,634 of them, but we might ask just how advanced these tanks are. Well, again, the country owns quite a few older models bought from the USA, Russia, and has also some homemade tanks. But in 2018, Iran's Deputy Defense Minister Reza announced that the country was in the process of building another 700 to 800 new tanks. The country also has 2,345 armored fighting vehicles, but compare that to the 39,223 armored fighting vehicles in the USA, which for the most part are much more modern. But where Iran is really weak is in the water, as it doesn't have a single aircraft carrier to speak of. Remember, the US has 20, the country has no destroyers either, but does have a 34-strong submarine fleet and 6 frigates. While Iran really is an underdog to the US military, that doesn't mean it isn't a strong military. Ranking militaries is difficult and shouldn't be taken as an exact science. Iran has had to be a strong military presence before, and it has a large, well-trained military because of its location in a volatile region. Reporting has stated that they have a ground force that includes over 1,600 tanks, 725 reconnaissance and infantry fighting vehicles, 640 armored personnel carriers, 2,322 towed and self-propelled howitzers, and 1,476 multiple rocket launchers. Yes, the numbers can change since we guess the press doesn't have a regular tank counter working all over the world, but we're guessing these numbers are pretty close to reality. Much like their air fleet though, much of this equipment is somewhat outdated and likely needing of either upgrading or a full replacement. Now we already know that the USA has some of the most advanced special forces units in the world and also is not bad at collecting intelligence through the CIA, NIS and both of their cutting edge computer technologies. But the Iranian forces have also a special branch that is said to be very highly trained and is an entity to be feared, the Quds Force, a special ops unit within Iran's revolutionary guards. They number around 15 to 30,000 very skilled agents and work in what you might call unconventional warfare. Iran also has the advantage in the event of an invasion of being a geographically difficult country to assault via land. It's a large country and the major cities are mostly located in areas that would be difficult for land forces to quickly reach. And now we come back to the start. What about these new fears of nuclear conflict? The New York Times writes this, Iran is still well more than a year away from being able to build a weapon, perhaps much longer. But the experts in the article also said it would take much longer to produce what the Times called a deliverable weapon. It's highly unlikely Iran is thinking about attacking the USA. And many European countries have blamed the US for putting Iran in a difficult position thanks to harsh sanctions. We won't get into the politics, but suffice to say, confrontation of military powers with nuclear weapons is not something anyone wants. As Newsweek points out, while the US military is by far superior in every way, an invasion would be a long drawn out affair. They wrote, if decades of difficult conflicts worldwide have taught the American military anything, it's that a mighty armory goes only so far. Let's hope for some diplomacy that works for both nations and the threat of a conflict behind us. June 11, 1969, Baria City, Vung Tau Province, Vietnam. A newbie tunnel rat arrived at the base to a scene of utter destruction. Just days earlier, a platoon was hit by an M16 mine, aka the Jumping Jack. It got that name for the way it jumped in the air when stepped on. It killed three men and injured 24 others. 
Not long after the hidden enemy laid an anti-personnel mine, a personnel carrier hit that mine. It was the first time that the unseasoned tunnel rat saw a dead body. It was chaos, each and every day. He had to learn fast. The number one tunnel rat, nicknamed Yogi, was hit twice by mines. Bits were hanging off him as he told the newbie what he had to do next. This was not a job for the faint of heart, but someone had to do it. That story is true. It happened to a combat engineer in the Australian Army. He took on one of the hardest and scariest roles in the war, that of a tunnel rat. We'll get back to his story, but first, let's talk about the job. Prior to the Americans going to war with the Viet Cong, the French fought the Viet Minh from 1946 to 1954. During that time, the Viet Minh learned a thing or two about fighting a superpower. To beat someone far more powerful than yourself, you had to resort to guerrilla tactics. One of those tactics was keeping below ground, and so the Viet Minh got to work building a massive complex of tunnels. When the Americans arrived in 1955, the tunnels were already vast, but it was the Viet Cong that really made them a feat of engineering. During the Vietnam War, or the American War to the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong used those tunnels for all kinds of things. While the opening to the tunnels was small, they might lead to a complex system of tunnels that would lead to large underground spaces. It was within these spaces that the Viet Cong would hide, eat, sleep, and machinate attacks on their enemy. The tunnels served as headquarters, hospitals, barracks, and storage facilities. Since they had ventilation systems, it was possible to stay down there for a prolonged period of time. So we're not so much talking about men burrowing like rabbits, but men living in a subterranean world. These worlds provided safety from the hostiles. Like snakes, the men would come out of them at night, lay traps for the enemy, and sneak back into the tunnel. And that's how so many American and Australian soldiers lost their lives, to mine-laying soldiers that were rarely seen above ground. It was actually an Australian combat engineering unit, the Three Field Force, that were the first tunnel rats. The Americans later joined them, but we don't imagine guys were queuing up for the job. Just imagine it. They find the entrance but have no idea where the tunnel will lead or who they will encounter down there. That wasn't the only threat of humans to worry about, too. Vietnam is in the tropics, and the tropics are home to all kinds of dangerous creatures. Have you ever seen a Vietnamese giant centipede? Those fast-moving, prehistoric-looking creatures deliver one of the most painful insect bites known to man. And guess what? They too like to hide in tunnels. Then there were the snakes, the highly venomous and deadly banded crate, the Malayan pit viper, the king cobra, and a whole host of other badass snakes that can spoil a person's day. The soldiers had to deal with ants' nests, annoying bats, rats carrying the bubonic plague, as well as spiders that weren't generally a threat to life but could make life painful. So you can imagine that going into one of those tunnels was about as frightening as getting into Ted Bundy's Volkswagen Beetle, but they had to do it, lest more men get blown to bits by these damned jumping jack mines. If the men can infiltrate the tunnels, they might not only kill a few of the enemy, but they would usually come across a stash of mines, grenades, and guns. There was another problem concerning arms. The tunnels were small, and so that meant that the tunnel rats couldn't take larger guns down them. They were usually only equipped with an M1911 pistol or an M1917 revolver. They'd also have a flashlight, a knife, and usually some explosives so they could blow up whatever they found down there. You can just picture it, a man crawling through the darkness, his flashlight in one hand and his pistol in the other. He crawls and crawls, and then he sees the enemy, he shoots, and then all he can hear is ringing in his ears. He's blinded by the flash and deafened by the noise. Then the earth above his head starts to fall. He needs to get out fast. What he doesn't know is that the Viet Cong have something special for him, poisonous gas. And this tunnel rat didn't choose the gas mask option because the last time he wore one he could barely see. If the gas doesn't get him, the flood will. The Viet Cong designed this particular tunnel with a flooding feature if it should ever be infiltrated. Other times, the tunnel might just collapse, which wasn't a design feature but a case of poor construction. You'd have to be crazy to do this job. You also had to be short. Imagine a hulk of a man with quite the belly trying to navigate around a tunnel. Soldiers that were picked for the job were usually not taller than 165 centimeters. It was the same years later when the US Marine Corps and British Royal Marines fought in the Afghanistan War. Yeah, tunnel rats weren't only a thing in Vietnam. But let's stay with Vietnam for now and go back to the Australian soldier. He was trained at the Australian Army's School of Military Engineering. He actually thought that this line of study would mean he'd be facing less combat and doing more engineering. He was wrong. He was being trained to become a tunnel rat. That meant learning about things such as mine detection, disarming booby traps, safely blowing stuff up, and learning how to get through tunnels. When he arrived in Vietnam, he walked into chaos. As we said, one of the first things he saw was the aftermath of a soldier stepping on a jumping jack mine. 
Three bodies were outfitted with body bags, and after that, two dozen men were wounded. He said those M16 mines were everywhere, and it was part of his job to find them. What the Viet Cong did was store them in the tunnels and then lay them at night, so each day was a new day and there was always a possibility of new mines lying around. That's why the tunnel rat had such an important job. Find where the mines were stored and blow up the tunnel and then no more mines. When he started the job, he worked as a tunnel rat number two. He worked in a pair with tunnel rat number one, and when six months was up, he became number one and he was joined by a newbie. He hadn't been a number two for long when he heard that a number one tunnel rat named Yogi had stood on a mine. Yogi was alive, but as you can imagine, he wasn't looking too well. In fact, only three Australians that stood on mines made it back home with their legs and lives intact. Yogi was one of them. He was lucky. The fatality rate in his unit was 33%. That's one reason why going into tunnels was not a prospect most soldiers liked. The Americans wanted to destroy the tunnels not from the inside but from the outside. If you dropped enough bombs on suspected tunnels, then they would cave in and anyone inside would suffocate. If you sprayed poisonous gases into them, the Viet Cong would die. You could also try and flood the area where the tunnels were and by doing that, drown the enemy. The problem was that these efforts didn't always result in success. The reason for that was the fact that the Viet Cong made more impressive tunnels. They made them blast-proof, flood-proof, and provided extra ventilation so the gases weren't effective. They also made them in a zigzag shape to mitigate the effect of an explosion. This is why the tunnel rat was indispensable. Those guys were the only thing that really worked. Believe it or not, most American soldiers were not chosen to do this job, but actually volunteered. Most soldiers thought you'd have to be out of your mind to do the work. The centipedes and the snakes were one thing, but suffocation in a collapsed tunnel was something from a nightmare. So why did they volunteer? One soldier back then said it was sometimes a macho thing. Soldiers did it to show others just how tough they were. He said that many tunnel rats had had problematic lives back home in the US, so they wanted to show that they could be useful. And useful they were, as well as brave. One tunnel rat named C.W. Bowman said that his fellow soldiers thought he was a maniac doing the job. He said they took bets each time he went into a tunnel and some men betted that he would die. Some men almost did, and this would become a weakness for the US military. We'll get around to that soon. Let's first take you through a mission. You shoot first and ask questions later. That was the mantra of the tunnel rat. Anything they came across, they shot at. They would usually fire only three bullets and then reload. The reason for this was the enemy wouldn't know how many bullets they had in the chamber. Let's say the mission was successful, and that the tunnel rat took out the enemy and discovered what was hidden down there. What would they find? On one mission, the tunnel was around 120 feet. At the end of the tunnel, the rat found places where men cooked and slept. As for items, he discovered eight rifle grenades, 40 pounds of salt, and 6,000 pounds of rice all of which was destroyed. On another mission, the tunnel rats found cameras, films, and printing presses, as well as weapons and ammunition. There was still a problem though, and that was the fact that even if the tunnel rats were successful, the Americans still had a problem winning the war. You can take out the tunnel, but there will always be more. This is a quote from Ho Chi Minh, the president of North Vietnam. You can kill 10 of our men for every one we kill of yours, but even at those odds, you will lose and we will win. Take for instance the use of booby traps, horrific things that killed around 11% of American soldiers during the war. Sometimes the Viet Cong would put a punji steak trap in a larger part of the tunnel. These were holes filled with sharpened bamboo that would be covered with branches and leaves. When a soldier stood on the trap, the spikes would impale him, and worse, the spikes might have been daubed with poison or feces. The soldier would then scream out, but he wouldn't die. This was the point, because the Viet Cong wanted more men to go down into the tunnel. Not only were there often more traps down there, but even if there weren't, pulling an injured man off sharp sticks and dragging him out through the tunnel was very time-consuming. The Viet Cong would later say that the Americans spent so much time and energy rescuing their injured comrades that they had lots of time to regroup and plan what they were going to do next. The sheer horror of these traps were also very bad for morale. This is what Ho Chi Minh was referring to when he said the Americans would not be victorious. He was right too. There were other kinds of traps. A tunnel rat might have hit a trip wire while crawling and then the tunnel would have collapsed on him. There's a story of a tunnel rat that popped his head out of one entrance and that triggered a spear that went through his neck. At other times, the Viet Cong made traps like something you might have seen in an Indiana Jones movie. A man could hit a trip wire in a tunnel and then a concrete ball studded with spikes would come flying at him. A lieutenant named Jack Flower said he experienced a totally different kind of trap. His comrade went into a tunnel and that man triggered a trip wire. After that, a box full of scorpions rained down on him. 
Snakes were also used. Sometimes the Viet Cong would place them in bamboo and tie them to the roof of the tunnel. When a soldier hit the bamboo, the snake would pop out and bite the man in his face. They scared the hell out of the soldiers, some of whom called them three-step snakes, because after you were bitten, you only had three steps before you died. That might be a bit of an exaggeration, but you can imagine being stuck in a dark tunnel with scorpions and snakes. Flowers went into over 100 tunnels. He later said this about the expeditions. In these tunnels, your adrenaline was pumping like a river. I swear I could hear my heart beating. You'd feel your way along for booby traps. It got so you could sense them. Same for the VC. You could smell another human being in the tunnel. You knew he was waiting for you in the dark. All of these horrors that the Viet Cong created instilled so much fear in the men that volunteering to be a tunnel rat wasn't exactly on every soldier's mind. But someone had to do it. They had to do it for the team, so to speak. This is what one American said about hiding in tunnels. We often wondered how things happened in the night, and we never saw what was going on. Guys getting their throats cut. Nobody ever knew where these guys were coming from. They had to go down every tunnel they could find, otherwise strange things happened during the night. It created tremendous psychological stress not knowing where the enemy was, so sending down tunnel rats was some peace of mind. There were successful tunnel campaigns, such as Operation Crimp and Operation Cedar Falls, but in the end, the Viet Cong proved to be more resilient. While the American soldiers were literally having nervous breakdowns going into the tunnels, the Vietnamese soldiers were at home in them. If the tunnels were destroyed, they just built more of them. The Americans had the task of Sisyphus, pushing the giant rock up a slope for eternity. As for the fate of the tunnel rats, there isn't any data on how many of them died. But it's thought that most of them succumbed during those horrific explorations of the Vietnamese subterrain. Out of 100 or so tunnel rats in the American army, only 12 of them lived to tell the tale of those tunnels back on American soil. One of those men was Jack Flowers. He later said, why did we do it? I wasn't a tough guy. Nobody who knows me would ever suspect I could do what the tunnel rats did. I'd never want a son of mine to have to do it. Thank God he said that these days men don't have to do what he did. The rise of the YouTube star, a fairly recent phenomenon, is making some young folks very wealthy without having their stardom officially sanctioned by mainstream plaudits. One such star, PewDiePie, was riding the wave of fortune until last year his popularity, in the media at least, took a hit. As hate seems to be as popular as love on social media, it's not surprising he gained even more followers after his YouTube faux pas. It's reported that the 27-year-old Swede, real name Felix Kjellberg, made around $15 million in 2016 alone. His videos might be a tad silly, but that seems to work for his 57,208,847 YouTube subscribers who've watched his goofiness an astounding 16,091,506,768 times. Not long ago, one man claimed he was going to overtake PewDiePie, and that's who we're going to look at today in this episode of the Infographic Show, Jake Paul vs. The Average American. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell button so that you can be part of our notification squad. First of all, when Business Insider put together a list in May containing the world's 20 most popular YouTube stars, Jake Paul wasn't even on the list. If he really is posing a threat towards PewDiePie's YouTube supremacy, he has a long way to go. The list put PewDiePie in first place with 54.2 million subscribers. Since the article was published in May, the numbers have obviously changed. Second on the list was Latin America's biggest YouTube hit, German Germandia, with 31.2 million subs. Third was Spaniard Ruben Doblas Gundersen, aka El Ruben. OMG with 23.5 million subs. Fourth was the comedy duo known as Smosh with 22.6 million subs. And fifth was Canadian youngster Evan Fung, whose gaming channel has 20.2 million subs. We don't need to tell you that all these people are multi-millionaires. As for our boy Jake, where does he stand? Well, if you check his YouTube analytics, he's doing alright for sure. As of this writing, his channel has 10,453,927 subs, and in the last 30 days he's gotten almost a million more. The England is my country infamy no doubt bolstered his current success. His videos have been watched a staggering 2,221,000,000 277,736 times, and in the last 30 days, 430,746,000 times. With those figures, he certainly has some room to boast about rising up the ranks to meet his Swedish nemesis. But how does he compare to the average American? A quick look at his basic information shows the 20-year-old Jake Joseph Paul was born in Cleveland and grew up in Ohio. His dad was a realtor and his mom was a nurse. This makes Jake what we call a millennial, somewhere between the age of 18 and 34. 
The median age in the USA is currently 37.8 years old, according to the last available statistics. So he's much younger than most American folks. He is, however, in the same age bracket, 18 to 24, as 30.8 million Americans, or 9.5% of the population. As for the millennial YouTube generation, aged 18 to 34, they make up 23.4% of the American population, or 75.5 million people. We can perhaps understand this popularity by collating this number with the largest group of YouTube consumers by age, which is is, again, 18 to 34 years old. We can't find the statistic for how many people in the USA were born on January 17th, but our ambitious Capricorn called Jake was born on the same date as Muhammad Ali, Benjamin Franklin, Al Capone, Kid Rock, Andy Kaufman, and Jim Carrey. If you've watched Jake's antics, the last three might make some sense, although he may have some growing up to do. Jake has one brother, also a YouTube star, so his two-child family is less than the American average of 2.6 children per family. As for his ethnicity, it's difficult to find any information, but when we looked at the etymology of his family name of Paul and his mother's maiden name of Stepnik, we can assume he has European ancestry, possibly a mix of German, Austrian, or even Scottish or French. This would put his ethnicity as a white American, the same as 72.4% of other white Americans. If he does have German ancestry, that would also tie him to 17.1% of Americans with German ancestry. We might also surmise that he is Christian, or at least comes from a Christian background. About 97% of all Ohio residents who affiliate with a religion are from one of various Christian churches. 70.6% of the American population identify as being Christian, while agnostics and atheists now outnumber the smaller religions in the US. As for Jake's face, he looks like a European with his blonde hair and brown eyes. According to the Huffington Post, natural blondes in the USA only make up 5% of the population. Brown-eyed folks make up around 41% of the population, although sources seem to differ on the exact percentage concerning eye color. One website that publishes the measurements of celebrities tells us that Jake Paul is athletic, 6 feet 2 inches tall, and 192 pounds. This makes him much taller than the average Joe in the US, who is said to be around 5 foot 9 inches. His weight of 192 pounds for such a height definitely doesn't make him a sufferer of the great American obesity epidemic. The average American man presently weighs 195.5 pounds, according to the Center for Disease Control. According to some reports, Jake didn't technically finish high school, and he left the place disgruntled with education, as well as leaving behind a few people that have come out and said he was a bully. He's quoted as saying he wouldn't have returned to that place unless it wasn't a Rolls Royce, but we cannot confirm this as the source looks quite dubious. But let's say Jake didn't finish high school. According to the Department of Education, that makes him much less than average, as over the last few years, the rate in the USA has been around 80 to 83% of kids getting their high school diploma. But Jake may have left for a good reason, just as Bill Gates bid adieu to Harvard before getting his hands on a bit of signed paper. Jake left home and moved to Los Angeles. This makes him a little average, as his yellow brick road type dream has become a bit of a cliche, as well as LA being the second most populated city in the USA behind New York City. Its population is 3,976,322. He went there for fame and fortune, and according to some sources, lives in an apartment with his Team 10 work buddies for a rental cost of $17,000 a month in the small neighborhood of Beverly Grove. We looked at rentals in this area and found some nice places for $4,000 a month, and one very cool looking pad for $7,500 a month, so no doubt Jake is paying more than the average for this area. The latest data shows the average rental cost in LA is $2,014 a month, but the average in the entire country is closer to $1,000. He's also causing lots of trouble for his neighbors, which could land him a fine for causing a public disturbance. He pretended to have been arrested, but that was just a prank, and so Jake can't yet join the ranks of one in three Americans that have been properly arrested by the police. Jake might not care, having made obscene amounts of money for his bling and expensive stunts by the time he was barely old enough to vote. It's thought his present net worth is around $4 million. That doesn't seem like much compared with some of the figures we often discuss in our shows, but CNBC reports that he was a self-made millionaire by the time he was 19. In another report, CNBC said that America now had a record number of millionaires at 10.8 million, which is around 3% of the 323 plus million population. Nonetheless, research shows us on average it takes a self-made millionaire 32 years to acquire that fortune, while Jake did it at hyperspeed. Even more impressive is the fact that the average net worth for someone aged 18 to 35 in the USA, according to the Census Bureau, is $6,676 for a man. Even at the highest range for a man at 65 to 69 years old, the average net worth is $194,229. Most folks without a high school diploma in the USA will make an average wage of about $20,241 a year. When interviewed by CNBC on TV, Jake said once he got savvy to better monetization practices, his salary went from six to seven figures. We don't have much time to talk about Jake's likes and dislikes, but we do know he likes his pet dog. 
According to insurance research, Jake being a dog owner puts him with another 60.2 million American households. So, what do you think about Jake Paul? Do you aspire to do something similar? Let us know in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other video called Bill Gates vs. the Average American. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time!